Je faites l'appel, s'il vous plaît, M. le greffier. M. le Sainte Ghost. Présent. M. le Sainte Fanon. Présent. Madame Sainte Ferguson. M. le Sainte Le Fondre. Présent. Madame Sainte Valois. Présent. Madame Sainte Meur. Présent. M. le Sainte Pallets. Présent. M. le Sainte Mesec. Présent. M. le Connétable de Saint-Hélier. Présent. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Clément. Présent. Madame le Connétable de Saint-Laurent. Présent. Madame le Connétable de Saint-Sauveur. Monsieur le Connétable de saint prélat Présent. Monsieur le Connétable de Grivelle. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Jean. Présent. Monsieur le Connétable de la Trinité. Présent. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Pierre. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Marie. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Wan. Présent. Madame le Connétable de Saint-Martin. Présent. Madame le Deputy Martin. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Southern. Présent. Madame le Deputy de Greville. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Lewis. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Tadier. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Higgins. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Massel. Présent. Madame le Deputy Pennell. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy de Saint Martin. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy de Saint Juan. Présent. Madame le Deputy Dublé. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Labby. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Wickenden. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy de Saint Marie. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Truscott. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Young. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Ash. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Morel. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy Guida. Présent. Monsieur le Deputy de Saint Pierre. <coughs> Présent. Monsieur le député de la Trinité. Présent. Monsieur le député de Saint-Jean. Présent. Madame le député de Lagra. Présent. Monsieur le député Aye. Présent. Madame le député Perchard. Monsieur le député Ward. Présent. Madame le député Alves. Présent. Monsieur le député Pamplin. Présent. Madame le Deputy Gardner. Présent. Monsieur Doyen. Notre aide soit au nom de Dieu qui a fait les cieux et la terre. Amen. Seigneur Dieu, Père éternel et tout puissant, qui a établi les gouvernements et les puissances de la terre, pour le règlement et pour la conduite du peuple, et qui nous a commandé d'avoir toujours pour vu la gloire de ton saint nom. Nous te prions qu'elle te blesse de donner à cette assemblée le don de conseil des prudences, donner les cœurs et les affections de tous ceux qui la composent, et de les conduire tellement toi-même par ton Saint-Esprit que toute leur délibération est ton accompagnée de la bénédiction. Réassis au bien-être au soulagement du peuple, qui ne plus te commettre à leurs soins. Car nous t'en prions, mon nom et par les mérites de ton Fils bien-aimé Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur qui nous a enseigné de t'invoquer en descendant. Notre Père, qui est aux cieux, ton nom soit sanctifié, ton règne vers ta volonté soit faite dans la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain quotidien, et nous pardonnons nos offenses, nous pardonnons à ceux qui nous ont offensés, et ne nous invite pas une tentation, mais délivre-nous de mal. Car à toi, à la, la, la puissance de la gloire, au siècle des siècles. Amen. Amen. Madame la Sainte Ferguson. Excusez. Madame la Connétable de Saint-Sauveur. Présente. 
Monsieur le Connétable de Grivel. Présent. Monsieur le Connétable de Saint-Pierre. Présent. Monsieur le Connétable de Sainte-Marie. Présent. Madame le Deputy Pershaw. Excusez. Les États sont en nombre, Monsieur le Président. Les États sont constitués. Uh, we now continue with uh, public business and the debate on the migration control policy. Currently under consideration by the Assembly is the Chief Minister's amendment to Deputy Dublé's amendment. And uh, the next list to speak is Senator Moore. Senator. Thank you, sir, and good morning. Um, so I simply wanted to assist members uh, by sharing with them a reflection on some of the scrutiny work that has been conducted uh, in relation to uh, the work of uh, the policy development board that formulated uh, the majority of uh, the policy before us in the migration control measures. Uh, and um, uh, I looked back at uh, the report that was led by Deputy Pershard back in November 2019 and, and felt that some of the key findings there were quite relevant to this question of, of whether we should support uh, the amendment uh, brought by the Chief Minister or the amendment uh, brought by Deputy Dublé today. Um, Key finding uh, five of that report said the diversity of the Migration Policy Development Board was not satisfactorily considered during the board's establishment. Uh, key finding six read when the chair of the Migration Policy Development Board was asked about concerns regarding the board's lack of diversity, his answer was unsatisfactory and did not appear to present a sufficient understanding of the problem. Um, so, sir, I share those points with the Assembly this morning, uh, just simply to identify uh, how um, the group who have brought forward these policies uh, simply have a lesser understanding than the Deputy Pershard um, on this matter. And it is indeed a very important matter. Uh, because if I could quote from Matthew Syed, whose excellent book Rebel Ideas highlights exactly, and perhaps I ought to gift this to some members of the Council of Ministers, um, he, he identifies really well um, the absolute necessity for uh, diversity in our modern world by expressing um, this. Harmonious thinking can be dangerous by clones who are individually intelligent but collectively stupid. Harness the power of diversity and the rebel idea. Bring people together who think differently to advance the collective brain and solve the world's wicked problems. So population, as we all know, is one of the island's wicked problems and it is therefore of absolute importance that a diverse uh, group is formed uh, in order to push these forwards and therefore, sir, uh, and for the reasons outlined, I will not be supporting this amendment, but I will be supporting uh, Deputy Pershard's amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Does any other member wish to speak on the Chief Minister's amendment? Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, sir. So I'm just trying to get the camera sorted out. Um, right, sir. Thank you. Um, I think just I'd like to try and uh, uh, I, I'm glad I'm following the last speaker, sir. And I, I uh, acknowledge a, a number of the points she's made, obviously. Um, and obviously, sir, this is very much going to be a decision for the Assembly. Uh, I think it is worth just pointing out, sir, that certainly finding five uh, was around the diversity of the Migration Policy Development Board, i.e. Uh, the group that I put together um, uh, to actually do the work on the policy, on the development of policy. It wasn't actually about the, uh, as far as I'm aware, sir, about the actual um, amendment that we're talking now, I'd be talking about now. But anyway, um, to bring us back to the, the point of the uh, the amendments and the, and the debates we're having, obviously, sir, just to remind members, we are accepting, um, as we've said in our uh, report to uh, the um, to this amendment, we're accepting uh, uh, the 
essentially a change to Part B and the new uh, C8. So to just be clear, that the only issue we have is around what is the wording of what we're calling paragraph C7. And I think it's worth just making the point, sir, um, that uh, one of the reasons for um, going for, for example, uh, countries less than 500,000 versus islands less than 500,000 is that islands uh, would, in, for example, include the Isle of Wight and Staten Island. Um, and obviously, sir, they don't, for example, have border control issues. Um, and equally, sir, uh, as has been uh, pointed out already uh, yesterday, is that we are relatively in a unique position as an island, when I say relatively in unique, because we have uh, a, the problem of population we have is a significantly increasing population, uh, whereas many islands are decreasing. We also have, and I mean this absolutely generally, we do have world class industries that need, need servicing, and that is all relevant when we're looking at the makeup and the experience of the people who are going to be um, uh, in essentially uh, providing uh, advice in this area if the uh, if this part of the overall proposition uh, as amended or, or and as not amended uh, is finally approved by the assembly but what i wanted to do is um, just go back to the i think the fundamental point of this particular part of the debate which is the problems associated with having a very specific rigid criteria uh, for example, as a, a gender balanced panel, as opposed to the criteria of placing this under the guidance of the Jersey Points Commission, um, which is obviously consistent with all similar other such appointments that uh, we as an assembly um, uh, essentially uh, uh, have put in place uh, in the past. And in fact, sir, from memory, um, it goes back to, I think it was Deputy Roller Heresier, who, um, who was probably one of the people behind uh, certainly some of the things as to why so many uh, individual issues were coming back to the assembly and why should they be, why would an individual put their name forward to then potentially, uh, obviously lots of personal details being put into the public vein by parliamentarians. But I think it's worthwhile um, essentially going over the slight history of how this uh, amendment has, uh, has evolved. So originally, sir, um, in the original proposition that we lodged, uh, it was to provide for an independent statutory expert panel to research and advise on population matters. That was it. And obviously, sir, that would have been done, um, the, the composition would have been done uh, through the, the standard guidelines that we have, obviously absolutely aiming for the type of balance that we are all talking about and wanting to achieve. And so to an extent, we're all in vehement agreement about the principle is actually the ramifications of the detail now, what uh, then um, uh, came through was that the first amendment by Deputy Pershard read as follows, which is to provide for an independent statutory expert panel, fine, that is representative of the population, i.e., uh, we assume the island's population, in terms of age, gender and ethnicity, and includes locally resident expert advisors to research and advise on population matters. And that was very, very rigid, sir, and, and it caused uh, an issue because uh, I think a combination of issues around whether that should be achievable uh, um, in terms of what is an, a local expert advisor on population, that, that you're narrowing your field, but also bearing in mind that we were talking about um, potentially a panel of three or four, uh, how you actually then get it representative in the way uh, that we were talking about and what that means in terms of, rigid, of rigidity. And so, for example, um, and this is a, a reasonable scenario, if, if one was to have a panel of four, and actually, um, there actually turned out to be, for example, three women and one man that ended up in the shortlisting process. Uh, even if uh, the, for want of a better expression, the third woman was eminently better than another man in that shortlisting, you would not be able to select her if it was then a gender balanced, it had to be a gender balanced panel. And that is the uh, what we're saying. I'll come back to the process of the Appointments Commission in a minute. And therefore, so what the amendment that we're debating now is about having an expert panel appointed subject to the oversight of the Jersey Appointments Commission, and obviously then so with the at least one member of which has proven expertise in small country populations defined as less than £500,000. And that's just to give a, a, a broader base that we can select from. Obviously, if it's uh, countries will include islands and one can actually Google that if one wants to, but it does then just allow that sort of wider experience to be brought in to the um, to what is actually meant to be effectively an independent uh, source of, if you like, brain power to give some um, 
advice, and I absolutely emphasise the advice, into what is a really multifaceted and complex issue. Then just to come back to the final point, so in terms of, uh, again, uh, dealing with the Jersey Appointments Commission, um, and, and again, bear in mind, this is obviously in principle, in other words, um, any rules and regulations that come in about or come back around the makeup of the panel, if they aren't satisfactory, obviously uh, members and no doubt scrutiny will have some quite detailed and specific record recommendations at that point in time and obviously amendments can come through. So um, uh, that's why to an extent um, I, I, uh, I think keeping it flexible at this stage might be uh, to all of our advantages but again a matter of the assembly for the assembly. Anyway so the um, as laid out in our in the report to our proposition the um, Jersey Points Commission has a number of standards uh, against which uh, all appointments should be made. And I think the key ones in their process are as written down, but I will read them out because it is worth just uh, listening to them. Number two, the principles of equal opportunity and diversity must be inherent within the process. Number three, each role will be advertised in such a way to encourage applicants from all sectors and groups, especially those who are underrepresented at senior levels within the public service. Number four, every prospective applicant must be given equal and reasonable access to adequate information about the job and its requirements and about the selection process. Number five, selection technique, techniques must be reliable, consistent and guard against bias and be in line with discrimination legislation. Number six, selection must be based on robust objective criteria applied consistently to all candidates. And for example, sir, those guidelines are used to appoint the control and order general uh, and other uh, very eminent posts. And to date, I don't believe anyone has raised any issues in that process. And therefore I'm slightly concerned when uh, people might um, uh, start challenging that process uh, for, for these kind of a specific areas. It either works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, very happy to uh, again impart further information and have that discussion. But um, they're also very clear that once one has selected the pool based on those guidance, which is about avoiding discrimination in any shape or form, it then should be on a merit basis. Because how would one feel, and I use the example, if one had a woman and a man, and the woman is actually uh, the better host, that actually having a gender balanced panel, for example, would require, because of the way the numbers of the selection process has gone, the man to be selected. And it works both ways, but that is the fundamental issue one is having to grapple with here. And so for all of those reasons, um, <clears throat> as I said, this is not um, uh, or shouldn't be held out as a battle between people set in a, a mindset of the dark ages around diversity and people who are shining the light on the area and, and no agreement between the two. We are all trying to achieve the same thing, but it's actually around uh, making sure that the process can actually work. As I said, if um, uh, from a principles based point of view, which is really what this proposition is about, there's a lot of regulation which will have to come back during later in the year. If there's specifics that need to be made at that point, very happy to also have those discussions and see what we can tweak and also very happy if members would wish to arrange uh, a briefing and a meeting with the appointments commission to understand how that process works because i've obviously now I've been through it a couple of times and it is um it is quite a thorough process that we see uh, i'm going to stop there so i think um i make the point um there are ramifications for not uh, adopting this amendment I know there are members who have concerns around the principle of having a, an independent panel. That's obviously un, uh, undoubtedly going to come up in the main debate. But um, in terms of trying to avoid unintended consequences, that's what we're trying to do by bringing this amendment. It's a very much, much a matter of the Assembly, whether they support it or not. I would ask members if you would seriously consider that um, because, because of the reasons I've outlined and which obviously Deputy Hewlin will also sum up on. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Minister Deputy Gardner. Thank you, sir. And I'm pleased to follow previous speaker, the Chief Minister. Uh, as I agree, it's not about the battle between dark age and today. At the same time, I was listening to the debate with great interest yesterday and today, and I'm finding myself wondering, are we in 2021 or are we in 1921? I'm not sure. I'm from an era before we were multiple, there were multiple genders. Uh, 
I'm old enough to remember time before the internet. Even as old as I am, moves to block uh, gender equal boards and panels is from a time in the past, which I cannot personally connect with. Why? Are you really proposing that a male dominated board will make fairer decisions? That having an equal number of men and women making decisions weaken the decision making process? I believe it would be the same reason and male dominating board weaken the decision uh, making process. And for me, equality, it should work, like Chief Minister said, both ways, not prioritizing one of the groups. Women are in part of workforce. Women are participating in all aspects of working life. But it seems they are not wanted on board making decisions that involve employment of men and women and such important policy as immigration policy. This assembly needs to look at like the population of Jersey. All aspects of our government need to represent the people of Jersey as they are. All races, gender, ethnicities. To suggest that the board that the equally men and women is somehow less capable is an insult to the half of the population in Jersey, including me. And for me, and this is start to drive me crazy, the best person for the job argument. I agree with this. But anyone who assumes the best people for the job wouldn't be an equal split between men and women. Well, are they saying that men are cleverer than women? We need, we need to put processes in place which will result in desired outcome, which is gender inequality. Yes, we do have processes in the, in the commission, but somehow it doesn't work. Looked at the top jobs in our civil servants. Somehow it didn't work. If you, and I'm not saying that something wrong, we have great people who are leading the island to the hopefully good places, but the gender inequality is missing. If you would expect outcome on merit, you would expect to have more women than men on senior position. If we look at the data of achievement, girls are outperform boys in every level of education. It has been pointed out at gender pay gap review. There is definitely something still wrong. What Deputy Purchase Amendment does, it's to put processes in to get the best panel we can get and therefore the best outcome for Jersey. Amendment from Chief Minister completely negate the process that Deputy Purchase are trying to put in place. If we agree that men and women are equally capable, then we, when we are looking over the entire globe for a handful of people to form a panel, of course you get equal numbers of men and women easily. Not just to tell we want gender equality, but we keep doing the same for a long time. Change is needed now. It's been a such important process. We need the best people for the job. I absolutely agree. We need people on the merit and it should be the gender balance panel to obtain the better outcome for the island. We just need to work harder. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Santomese. Uh, thank you, sir. I, I will speak only uh, very briefly on this. Um, I've listened to both sides of the argument on here. One side um, suggesting uh, what's essentially a quota and one side suggesting that we'll just go by best of intentions and see how we go. Uh, and it reminded me of the moment where I became convinced by an argument a few years ago in support of quotas rather than anything else. It was at a CPA conference in conversation with a Welsh Labour MP who uh, explains to me in just two words why uh, quotas are better. Those two words were, they work. It's as simple as that. If you go for Deputy Pershard's amendment, we will get what we're after in terms of that balance. If we go for 
the uh, Council of Ministers version, we won't. And it's as simple as that. Um, it'll be best of intentions that may well be completely sincere, but unless there's a requirement for it to be representative, it's not going to be. And I, if we're going to go down this path of having the, uh, this sort of board, which I've got some scepticism about, but if we are going to go about it and want it to be representative, we have to go for Deputy Bershard's amendment, very simply because it'll work. Thank you. Very much, Senator. Does any other member wish to speak on the uh, Chief Minister's amendment to uh, Deputy Bershard's amendment? If another member wishes to speak, Deputy Lehegger. Thank you, sir. Uh, I too, like Deputy Gardner, have um, listened for nearly three years now about jobs on merit. And quite frankly, sir, that I am quite tired too about it. There's no doubt that at any process, people will put forward those that are similar to themselves. I would also, sir, like the um, proposer of this amendment to actually outline for me, because I don't have it to hand, exactly the makeup of the Independent um, Jersey Appointments Commission. And that, sir, is because if we are going to have a position where they will oversee it, one assumes that they will ensure that their makeup is also actually um, diverse, because obviously that would maybe be unfair if it wasn't. And of course, these things all come to interview. And so it will be dependent on who maybe fares better in an interview on the day. It is well known in the private sector that diverse boards are recognised for their value. And I have to say, I echo what Senator Mezek said in relation to the fact of nobody wants to work on the basis of quotas. However, I do have to agree with him that if we are going to get a proper balanced board, we may have to do that. But it's interesting because if we are going to ask for applicants to be on this board, one assumes that when we look at those applicants, we will see people that have got the criteria for the role that we are looking. And so therefore, one would assume, sir, that there will be a good balance of individuals. And if there is not, then maybe we need to look more broadly at where we are asking those applicants to come from. It is essential for us as an island to make sure, looking forward, that we have diversity on our boards. Because if we don't, sir, we're never going to get out of the dark ages and we need to, because it's important for all of our population within Jersey to feel that they are valued and that they are accepted. And I think if we don't move forward on this, sir, they never will. Thank you, sir. Very much, uh, Deputy. Uh, Connie Tarb of St Martin. Thank you, sir. I just want to echo some of the um, thoughts, um, comments made by Deputy Lehegre and uh, Deputy Gardner. And I'd like to say that um, mindsets just have to change. As Deputy Gardner says, we're in 2021, we're not in 1900. Women are not a minority group, and I will say that you know, to the end of my days. We are not a minority group. The number of men and women in the world is roughly equal. Um, women make up half of the world's population. So it makes no sense whatsoever to vote for this amendment. I'll be voting for Deputy Pershard's amendment. It is not perfect, um, but it, it is a way forward. So um, I will not be voting for this amendment. I'll be voting for Deputy Pershard's amendment. We have to make some progress. We really do need to progress in this assembly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Martin. Yes, thank you, sir. And I was checking the um, who sits on the appointment board last night and um, it's chaired by a woman. There's five other commissioners and three of them are women. Um, and really does that affect um, who they appoint? Um, the overriding, as the Chief Minister said a few moments ago, is on the the merits of the candidate. And I was then pressured to speak, sir. I thought everything had been said until I heard Senator Mezek that quotas work. Well, 
I would stand up against any man, sir, in any job that I went for, and I want to be, and I will be appointed on the merit that I'm the better person for the job. I don't like the idea of quotas. I don't like the idea that you should have um, just because you're a woman, split it down the middle, and that they'll be the right person for the job. Again, and also I, I was prompted to speak by Deputy Gardner, who sees something in this amendment that's absolutely not there. She's talking about a male dominated uh, panel. No, this could be all women. I mean, the deputy said, Deputy Gardner said, so look around the world, we can find lots of women. Well, please let, because I was on the, the board, um, let me know where these people are. And if they are all women, so be it. But the actual amendment, Deputy Pershaw's amendment, precludes that because we couldn't have all women even if they were best for the job, sir. And I wasn't going to speak, but I I reheard again what Deputy Morrell said yesterday, and maybe the Chief Minister was a lot more polite than me, but I absolutely want to distance myself when he says he thinks he speaks for many members in this assembly, and I think I'm quoting incorrectly, that we do not believe the Jersey Appointments Commission should be overseeing uh, top jobs because look at the terrible things they've done in the last three years. Well, I'd like to remind many assembly members so that every board and panel we have, discrimination, employment, etc., has come to the assembly and it's all been overseen by the Co Appointments Commission all local people who are doing the jobs and they're doing them well. And yes, Deputy Pershard was right. When I brought, um, I think it was employment forum uh, uh, positions to the assembly, we were up the fort, sir. I think we were having a funny day because we were up the fort for the first time in, and there was a pandemic going. I got questioned and it wasn't on gender, sir. Deputy Ward and Deputy Taddeo questioned the um let's say the knowledge of the people i was presenting because if they had to um decide on a, an employment issue had they ever been unemployed had they ever did this it was called back sir i explained to everyone exactly how the process worked it was overseen by the employments commission i do not get involved it came back two weeks later and everyone was put in post and they're all there doing a fantastic job for the island, sir. So I absolutely disassociate myself with Deputy Morrell, but he's absolutely right. If he thinks that it's so terrible, he has it in his gift to bring a proposition any time or sit down with his ministers, the council of ministers, then the assembly and change it. Not just take the headlines that everything has been bad. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Martins. Any other member wish to speak on this amendment? Senator Farnham. Um, um, thank you, sir. And um, I'm, I'm finding this a surprisingly uh, difficult um, decision because, um, as deputies Dublin and Pershard will know, and other members, I have um, I've been a willing and eager student to to engage with this because I'll, I'll be the first to admit that it took me some time being um, uh, a sort of um, middle age white sort of however I'm described from time to time um, cultures um, change and, and I feel I've made a lot personally and the assembly and the island are, are, are making good progress in in dealing with unconscious bias and understanding why gender equity and, and diversity is um, important but I'm finding it difficult not to support this amendment in relation to the um, the, the expertise, the small but important uh, um, um, part of the amendment, which refers to um, one expert or a group of gender balanced experts. And I think that pushes up against diversity and could actually um, restrict the selection process. Of, of course, we, we work with the Appointments Commission who are working within in the state's approved policy and it, it's clear that that um, probably needs to be challenged or changed or, or amended in due course and that's um, uh, going to be a, an important debate that I, I look forward to in the future. So um, I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm, I'm please do not misinterpret my vote on this today 
as as a backward step in relation to the gender equity um, issue, sir. It's it's in relation to the to the wording around the expertise. Either way, whichever the way the vote goes, I think we will have um, a good way forward and we will produce a very balanced um, uh, panel to, to deal with this. So that's um, all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Senator Pallet. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm pleased to follow uh, Senator Farnham. A lot of what he says uh, I agree with, apart from the um, where I think his decision is going to go. Um, I'm only going to speak, speak briefly. Um, it's very often, it's not very often I actually change my position on, in a, in, during the debate, but um, this time I have. Um, there's been some very, very good speeches around diversity uh, and gender balance. And um, I think one of the, one of the, the, I suppose the speech and, and the words that, that ring true most to me are, are something that Senator Mezik said around his, um, the meeting he had with, a, I think it was a Welsh MP, is that um, it's not working or it doesn't work. And I think that's where we are. I think as much as I think the appointment, and I'm gonna, not going to say anything negatively about Jersey Appointments Commission, because I think they do an excellent job. And I think we all do, um, but I don't believe um, diversity uh, in any part of island life is moving quick enough. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to perhaps um, give it a little nudge forward. Um, the one issue I'd, I, I just wanted to, um, to to briefly touch upon is that in terms of gender balance on this particular panel, um, many things to do with um, population control. Um, and migration control have equal effect to men and women. Um, and especially in terms of um, uh, the effect it'll have on uh, families. And I think the, the debate on uh, uh, the, the, the main pro the debate on the, pro the main proposition, I think, will, will, will I suspect talk a lot about families uh, and families of migrant workers. And I think it's important that um, families are considered um, uh, in the right way uh, and given the right perspective um, and to do that I think you do need to have a gender um, uh, uh, balanced panel um, one that can assess both sides of the argument for both men and women um, because th th there are different arguments to be, to be made but I think um, what is going to be important is that um, we do consider uh, both in this when we're considering where we're going to vote on this and also in the main debate about um, the effect any migration controls have on family life and especially around the, the effect they're going to have on children um, because uh, there will be an effect any any controls we bring in will have a, an enormous effect on families family life and children and I think the only way to ensure that we've got a, an independent panel expert panel statutory panel that really have um, both sides uh, uh, fully consider the effects of family life is to, is to have a gender balanced panel. I know some believe that might be di too difficult to achieve. I don't believe that's the case. I think there are plenty uh, of people that would uh, be able to sit on this panel and provide the sort of expert advice we need. Um, and if that means we've got to look a bit harder, then maybe that's what we should do. I think what has come out of this debate is that um, there probably needs to be a review of uh, the criteria around the Jersey Appointments Panel uh, Commission. Um, again, I don't think they've done anything wrong. I think they do what we ask them to do. But once an organisation has been up and running for the time that it currently has, maybe it is a time to review um, the terms of reference that they've got. And maybe we need to have a look as, at an assembly about how we elect people to boards and um, to, uh, to other um, bodies connected with the states because if we can't get our act right um, then um, and not and be seen to be doing it uh, right then what hope do we have of attracting more people into the states attracting more uh, women to be uh, that are prepared to come and come into the quite what can be quite ferocious atmosphere of the states and the life that goes along with it so um, I, I've changed my mind I'm going to I'm going to vote to reject this amendment because I think we do need to move forward in terms of diversity and I think this is an opportunity to do it. Thank you, sir. Very much, Senator. Conor Tarbison, John. Thank you, sir. Sir, 
I have noticed something creeping in that uh, I'm finding disturbing. I was born in South Africa. And if you want to know about discrimination, well, there is apartheid and and I'm talking of the 1960s. It was rife. I've lived it and I know what discrimination is. I strongly support that all states members should undergo um, discrimination training, especially the unconscious bias training. What we are seeing today, very sadly, is unconscious bias that we should have a gender balanced committee. When I look at a committee, I see a group of individuals who have ability, who are volunteers, who have come forward for whatever reason and are willing to put their shoulder to the wheel. Those, that is what I look for. I don't care tuppence whether they are male, female, black, white, short, tall, bald, bearded or whatever. They are the individuals that I look for. And anyone who discriminates against a person for whatever reason is practicing unconscious bias. That is why I urgently support this amendment to the proposition. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Conitab. Does any other member wish to speak on this uh, amendment? Deputy Pampton. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, in reading the uh, the amendment to the amendments and the amendment itself, uh, the original uh, proposition of the original amendment says to provide an independent statutory uh, expert gender balanced panel. Uh, and I think that's all this is all about. Um, if you want the very best, then why don't we have the very best female candidates, the very best male candidates and the very best people to come forward. Um, that's my view on this. Um, I don't think there's anything else uh, untoward about it. Um, my personal view, though, is um, I think the members of the public and the island uh, are questioning how many expert panels do politicians need? We're elected by the people to make decisions and we obviously have to listen to a range of voices. Um, and I feel that's the bigger argument here that's been overshot. Why do we need to do this all the time? We are elected to make decisions and I think that's what I'm more concerned about. And I think that's where the island is seeing us uh, time and time again. Apart from stack during the pandemic, which was a good idea to have experts in that field to guide the decision making, the lines were being blurred of who is actually making the decisions and where is that information based on? And the public themselves get confused of what we do as politicians um, and who makes those decisions. And I think this is for me, my personal view, the crux of this issue. Uh, we are seeking to form an independent statutory. That's what our, my take on this is. So why don't we encourage the very best and form the very best female candidates, the very best male candidates and have a balanced independent statutory. But what I want to see more of is politicians just making decisions with policy that we debate uh, and not a year before the election. Thank you, sir. Thank very much. Does any other member wish to speak on this amendment? No other member wishes to speak on this amendment? Then I close the debate and uh, call upon the deputy of St Peter to respond. Uh, deputy Duble has asked um, whether or not the uh, individual paragraphs can be taken separately. Uh, that's a matter entirely for you, Deputy of St Peter. Uh, it's, it's a matter within your decision and gift. They can as a matter of logic, but uh, it's up to you whether you wish to have them taken. And, and thank you, thank you, sir, for that, well. that offer. And I thank uh, Deputy Duplay for the suggestion. I will review that towards the end of my summing up, if I may. Um, I'd like to thank all, all members for their comments and a very, very involved and, and impassioned debate of where, where people stand on this subject. And all those stances are to be respected and um, appreciated. Um, th there was one specific um, challenge uh, that I was given, um, which was from Deputy Gardner. No, sorry, Deputy Lahegra who wanted to know the makeup of the uh, Jersey Appointments Commission. Um, 
the deputy martin stepped forward um, as she spoke afterwards um, and i can confirm that it is made up of six people the chair is a lady uh, i don't know sir if i'm allowed to mention names in the assembly but it is in the public domain uh, the chair is is a lady and there are five other members uh three women and two men so the makeup is two to four in favor of women i'd also like to uh, say i have had experience of the jersey appointments commission because i worked with um, Deputy Gardner on the appointment of the Board of Governors for the Controller and Auditor General. And, and I believe later on in this assembly, we are to seek the members approval or the Chief Ministers to seek members approval uh, to appoint a new chair and two new lay members. The result was the chair is a, um, a lady member and the two lay members are male. Now, the makeup of that panel and that interview process, certainly for the chair, was uh, four people, two men and two women. And I recall very, very clearly uh, during that process that we were focused absolutely solely on skill, expertise and the right person to do the job. And I hope Deputy Gardner will support me on that because I don't think the mention of gender came up once. We were focused on, on the right people to govern the most important role and function we have in this island, which is the controller and auditor general. So I hopefully I've addressed that specific request from Deputy Lehegra. Uh, however, m moving on, um, listening to this debate intently, um, I will be supportive of many, if not all of the points put forward by many members, especially Deputy Dublé and Deputy Ward. And that will be if we were debating the recruitment or recruitment policy for government departments or if we're in private industry working in finance or or ho hospitality regardless i'd be totally in supportive of the premise of the gender neutral as it were uh, recruitment process giving everybody um, that opportunity um, and if that was a case of building a specific team together to be representative a diversity representative of that company or government department, I would be totally supportive of this. Um, and I think like Lyndon Farnham, I've advanced in my thinking. But we are not, um, I would like to bring members attention back to the actual subject in hand. We are not, this is not based on recruitment policy for government or for industry. It's based on bringing experts to help us and advise us in this very delicate subject. And as Deputy, Dublé says we need the best experts in their field to help us navigate our way through. As I said, one of the biggest challenges facing us in assembly, and I totally agree with her, we cannot compromise on the best experts that we can give us advice against which we can make decisions as we go forward now through the initial population policy and beyond. These individuals will already be experienced. We're not looking at recruitment or development of staff. We are already experienced in specialist academic areas such as labour economics, applied microeconometrics or intergenerational economic effects, for example. That was a mouthful. Now, let, let me share a thought. And, and the chief minister came up earlier with a hypothetical situation of putting together a panel of people. Well, this is a real example. The UK already has a similar panel, panel to the one we are debating today. This is the Migration Advisory Committee, and it is made up of five absolute experts who we would be honoured if they would respond to our call for people to come and help advise us. Google them. They're professors, PhDs. They are so good in their field, on paper that is. However, there's a minor problem here. They're made up, the panel of five, is made up of four women and one man. Now, if that was our shortlist today of the five people that we wanted to put forward, not what we're going to put it forward to the assembly, but there's an option for the assembly, should we uh, make that recommendation to, to veto it or bring it to the assembly. But if we were to bring that shortlist, we would have to drop one of those women and replace them with the next best man. That to me is a compromise and that would also leave one of those very talented women 
uh, turned down from her role because of her gender. That to me, I'm afraid, is a real, real challenge. So under my, under my amendment, or Chief Minister's amendment, we will cast our net far and wide to attract as many diverse candidates possible. And then we'll be able to best pick the best panel, regardless of gender. Now, again, I challenge you, would any of the aforementioned experts be comfortable applying to Jersey if they knew we had a selection policy that, prior, that prioritised gender over their proven expertise? Proven expertise, and if you look at the CVs as these examples of people we would hope to attract, potentially, you look at those CVs, you will find out that's been built up over many years of rigorous work and relevant study to be able to be in the position to give us that advice against which we make decisions, but that advice for, uh, to, to represent us. And I believe that the Appointments Commission takes full account of the need to have diverse membership among states members. This is clearly published in the guidelines, which the Chief Minister uh, read through earlier. The in committee debate I'm proposing will highlight the complexity of the challenges which we need to navigate. Excuse me. We will each have our own priorities and somehow we will need to end up with a policy which manages all the tensions, the tensions of our financial health, our society and our environment. Population affects all ministries and departments, including housing, education, health, environment, infrastructure, social security, etc. It's a tough problem to solve. And as my maths teacher would say, it's a meaty problem, which is why we need the very best population experts to analyze information and help us understand how we solve this very complex problem. I assure you, we will still make the political decision, however, to be based on fact and evidence. We can't afford to get it wrong. I'm no great historian, but I'm obviously interested in my island. But the island population dropped by 50% in the 1850s, 1860s, when our industry of the day, wooden hull shipbuilding, was surpassed by industries elsewhere, metal ships. And there's only one thing worse than a rising population that we have today, and I assure you of that, it's called a shrinking population. Yes, islands may have different challenges. You know, Antigua relies on tourism, uh, especially those that come for about two weeks, where we have an average day of three days, totally different dynamic. The BVI, which Virgin Islands is financed, Bermuda um, is very much focused on the insurance industry as, as well as tourists, mainly from the States. Tahiti, a wonderful place that I've never been to, it's on the bucket list, but stuck in the middle of the Pacific. What we, we learned from them is what is about isolation. So to sum up, the States have legal status the Appointments Commission in Proposition P99-2005 and they are now a legal body on the Employment of States of Jersey Employers Law 2005. There has been criticism of the Appointments Commission during this debate and if members no longer support the way in which the Commission operates then they are free to seek amendments to the law or challenge the guidance but I do not think it's appropriate for these issues to be raised in the debate on migration controls and I would ask members to accept my amendment so that we can get the right experts to help us draw and collate the right information and data for a population policy that is right for our beloved islands. I ask members to accept my amendment. And how, how do you wish to take second, the amendment? So I have to address Deputy Dublay's request of how we take it. I say it's entirely a matter for you. Um, uh, there's no, uh, there's no right to call upon to be taken separately, but um, taking them separately would simply change the wording, I suppose, in the, in the paragraph. I'm, I'm inclined to take it on block, but, but I think it's, um, it's only realistic to uh, accept the, what is quite clearly going to be the, uh, the Assembly's wishes uh, to take it in the three parts. Um, I, I haven't got the numbers of how it's consolidated, sir. However, the, the, the one to take separately is in the um, amendment as uh, C7, as I understand it, yes. which is the word that starts to provide for an independent statutory expert gender balance. Well, no, well, that's the only thing we're voting on. Um, so, so, sorry, uh, that is the case. No, but we're not, 
we're not we're not voting on the main migration policy. We're voting on the amendment. The request from Deputy Dublé is that the three parts of the amendment are each taken separately. Uh, they all relate to subparagraph seven of the. Uh, uh, and so and so the effect was that the first thing would be for the assembly would vote on the substitution for gender balance panel uh, with the words panel appointed subject to the oversight of the Jersey Appointments Commission. The second vote would be on taking away who have proven expertise and substituting at least one member of which has proven expertise. And the third would be uh, removing the word island and substituting the word country, all from uh, subparagraph seven. So it's a question of whether you wish to take those en bloc or whether you wish to take them separately. I, I think on review, having looked at the documents um, in a different light, so I'd like to take them on block. Very well. In which case, uh, I ask the, the Greffier to place a voting link. The vote is on the Chief Minister's amendment uh, to Deputy Pershard's amendment, and I open the voting and ask members to vote in the normal way. If members have had the opportunity of casting their votes. Then I ask the Greffier to close the voting. The amendment has been adopted, 25 votes pour, 21 votes contre, no abstentions in the link and a further vote pour in the chat. Very well, we now return to uh, Deputy uh, Pershard's amendment as itself has been amended. And um, the first person I have who indicated a desire yesterday to speak on this particular part was the Connetar of St. Juan. Do you still wish to speak on this, uh, Connetar? No, sir, I, th thank you for asking me, but um, I, I think the speech that I made earlier was, was the one that I wanted to make. Uh, I was just confused as to which amendment oh, I was going to speak to. Thank you. And the second person who indicated a desire to speak yesterday before we moved on to the uh, match we've just discussed was Deputy Ash. Um, I, mine was for the second part, sir. If, if I don't, don't speak now, am I still able to speak later if this debate develops or, or not? Uh, yes, if, if I mean, if it, you you told me that you wish to speak um, on the one that you did in fact speak on, you haven't indicated a desire to speak on this yet. It's open to you to do so. OK, I, I shall reserve reserve the right then, sir. Thank you. Very well. Um, well, then I open the debate on Deputy uh, Pershard's amendment as amended. Does any member wish to speak? This is about Deputy Pershard's amendment as it has just been amended. No member wishes to speak. Deputy Masson. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, it's a question for the proposer, um, which uh, I'm just struggling uh, with this because I'm just conscious of, of the cost implications for this particular uh, amendment and I wonder if the speaker because she didn't touch on that in the opening speech could just talk to that a bit more um, and given the place that Jersey is going to be with the costs um, going forward we know we're going to be looking at an economic recession whether this particular panel amongst everything else we've got to do is really the best use of public money um, and I wonder if the uh, proposed could respond to that thank you sir Thank you, Deputy. Does any other member wish to speak on this amendment? No other member wishes to speak. Then. Senator Moore. 
apologies sir. um just very briefly um i would uh, urge members to support uh, this proposition this amendment um uh, i appreciate deputy masson's point about the costs involved um however sir uh, data and the collection of data uh, to assist the formulation of um, contemporaneous policy decision making and 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 suitable reactions to it are are really important and and trump that uh, if we look at what has happened in terms of population in the past year um, alone uh, we as an assembly no longer really know um, what the impact uh, of events of the past year have been on the island's population. We have a sense that a considerable number of people have left the island. However, we, we do not have the relevant data. And I think that is exactly the example of, of why this needs to be uh, kept up to date uh, and properly accounted for so that decision making can uh, flex and adjust to what can sometimes be um, rapidly changing circumstances. Um, and, and that really is, is all I have to say in support of this amendment, sir. Thank you very much, Senator. Does any other member wish to speak on the amendment? If no other member wishes to speak, then I close the debate and call upon Deputy Dublé to respond. Thank you, sir. Um, in answer to uh, Deputy Massel, uh, absolutely, this is uh, something that, that should be done. And I think that the separate parts of the amendment, I believe that the deputy is uh, speaking to the citizens panel that would be established. And um, as an example, if we are uh, convening panels around assisted dying and climate change, then we should certainly do so for an issue such as migration, which is arguably um, at the top of the priority list for many islanders, which, you know, around election time, we will recall those conversations. So yes, I, I feel this is absolutely a good use of, of uh, public funds and uh, and members should certainly vote um, for all parts of this, uh, this amendment. I think it's a shame that um, the other part of the amendment has essentially been wrecked by the uh, the amendment to the amendment uh, but that is where we are and so uh, I um, I would like to ask that this is taken in parts uh, I maintain the amendment and ask for the appeal please well which how, how do you wish the matter to be dealt with in parts um, deputy I mean you do you wish um, each of the three lettered paragraphs or do you wish votes to be taken um, and that will be a, quite an exercise in connection with the Roman numeral paragraphs Just the three main parts of the proposition will be fine. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Sir, may I make a request? Uh, yes, uh, Deputy, what's that? Uh, yeah, can we, can we just be reminded of exactly how this, uh, what we are exactly voting on now? And I, I believe it is the amendments, the amendment, which is, which is transformed to be the amendment. So there's been no change to it, but I just like clarification of that. So, so we know where we are. I'm sorry, uh, you lost me with that characterization. What we are voting on is Deputy Pershard's amendment to the migration policy as amended by the Chief Minister's amendment, okay. which has been passed. As I thought, sir, thank you. If that assists you. Just one moment. Yes, never mind. Um, very well. Well, we can uh, now put a part A uh, for a vote. And I ask the Griffey to put the voting link in the chat.
And I open the voting and ask members to vote in the normal way. Right. Members have had the opportunity of casting their votes. So I ask the graphic to close the voting. Part A has of the amendment has been adopted. 37 votes pour, seven votes contre, no abstention in the link, and one further vote pour in the chat. We have the seven contra votes, sir. Seven contra votes. Seven votes contra were Deputy Masson, Deputy Wickenden, Deputy Martin, Councillor of St John, Councillor of St Mary, Deputy of Trinity, and Deputy Labby. Well, now open the voting. Uh, ask um, the give me a second. Ah. <laughs> we'll give the Greffe more, more than a second. In just, uh, in just a moment or two. Then uh, ask Greffy to post a link into the chat. The vote is on part B of the amendment. I open the voting and ask members to vote. So sorry to interrupt, but when we announce Deputy Labby, could we just be told which Deputy Labby it is? There is only one Deputy Labby. Um, sometimes members refer to the Deputy of Greville as Deputy Labby. That is a mistake, of course. Uh, the Deputy of Greville's title is exactly that, the Deputy of Greville. That's right. Thank, you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If members have had the opportunity of casting their votes, I ask the greffier to close the voting. Part B has been adopted, 38 votes for, six votes contra, no abstention in the link, and a further vote for in the chat. May we have the contra, please, sir? Contra votes, yes. Those members voting contra were Senator Falwar, Deputy Wickenden, Deputy Masson, Deputy Pamplin, Constable of St John and Deputy Martin. Well, um, in just a moment, uh, the Greffier will post a link for part C. The 
pro probably isn't time to pop out for a cup of tea or anything at this point, but uh, it'll come along shortly. Um, I haven't yet opened the voting, Connor Tarbus and Saviour. I see. I know I'm sorry, sir, but I've got to go to my funeral. Very well, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, I'm, sir. I'm prepared to take that vote uh, because it is clear what the assembly is voting on. Yes, please. I open thank the voting you, and ask members to vote in the normal way. If members have had the opportunity of casting their votes, then I ask the Greffier to close the voting. And part C has been adopted, 39 votes poor three votes contra in the link and one further vote for in the chat. Can we have the contra, sir? Thank you. Contra votes, yes. Those members who voted contra were Deputy Masson, Constable of St Mary and Deputy Wickenden. Very well, we now return to the debate on the main proposition, uh, the Chief Minister's policy as amended and um, that was duly proposed and seconded, and I had listed to speak uh, Deputy Ward. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I just put in the chat I, about that. Let me get my notes up. Thank you, sir. Let me frame that properly. OK. Um, thank you, sir. I wanted to speak early in this debate before it veers into the wider areas of discussion with population. And, and I note that the press reporting last night and probably tonight will be on population, uh, where we are talking about a migration debate. Um, in the last election, Reform and, and I, as a member of Reform, stood on a manifesto where we made clear the need for a permit system to enable genuine and meaningful targets for mig migration to be set. Genuine and meaningful targets is really key there. We also made clear that targets set must be followed and successive governments have failed to follow and meet any of the targets they've set. And this is where the proposition begins to become a real problem. Uh, there is a complete lack of detail in the proposition. Now, I understand the concept of agreeing a principle that can then be developed, but the very political nature of migration means we must have more clarity on the future direction and intentions of government. At the moment, this indeed creates a, a greater issue. It does appear that the intention is to outsource the political discussion and decision making around uh, migration to an expert panel. And, and, and there are, I have few, a few serious reservations regard this. First, I believe there's a serious difficulty in finding a specialist in small island migration. And this has been mentioned um, in terms of fitting our situation. Uh, from my communications and interaction with small islands via the CPA and at conferences, most school island communities face falling populations and do not have the issue of trying to limit populations. In fact, wh where which uh, jurisdictions that will match uh, Jersey in any way do. And so that is a serious issue that we're looking for. Um, more importantly, though, I have serious concern that advisory panels very quickly become the political and policy lead, as we've seen here happening, for example, with the fiscal policy panel. I can't remember the last time a Treasury minister went against any decisions of the fiscal policy panel. And so we do seem to have non-elected officials driving the political discourse. And I think that is a real problem. Um, decisions on migration and population are political decisions that need to be made by elected governments that were elected on the clear policy of what they would do. In this way, they are accountable for the decisions. 
Of course, take advice, but do not hide behind it or dissolve your self responsibility. And I have a real concern regards that. Uh, we are in the final year of a term, and this is the first time this has happened. And I'll come back to that point later on. Now, the policy sets out four distinct permissions, but within these words are within these are the words may lead to permanent residence. And in the briefing, there was a mention of an additional permission, the permission of four to ten years, and then permanency. I would like some explanation of this and how it may be used, and by what sectors of our society and our economy. The biggest problem is the lack of detail and therefore context to what this means for long term migration and for the workplace and for businesses and for service providers and for government services. Um, nine months permissions without, um, for example, nine months permissions without housing or residency rights. What protections for these people what are the protections for people who will come here to work and what sectors were they serving? The reality is that these will be the people paid the least. I am sceptical that there will be nine month contracts for accountants or CEOs or, or, or workers in highly paid uh, areas. And, and how many landlords offer nine month contracts? What rights will they include and what standards will the accommodation be kept to? We still do not have a licensing system for landlords. Will this transient population have extra added to their electricity bills to cream off as much possible while they are here with no actual uh, comeback if, if that happens? And how will we prevent that? All of these details are very important for a meaningful migration policy. Um, what will happen by uh, what will happen? What work will happen uh, for, from officers immediately after this debate? That's a question I would like the proposer to bring. We will be seeing work on identity, identity cards before the regulations have come to the assembly. I, for one, am very concerned about the uh, identity cards and identity card fraud, and that indeed was also in our manifesto. Uh, and what will be the immediate next steps after this vote? With the lack of clarity, we end up with um, uh, vacuums uh, which can be acted on by officers who are not accountable. Now, I hope that doesn't happen, but I want to hear from the assistant chief minister or, uh, who, or the proposer that say uh, that, that, that we have some reassurances about that. Now, we then have the four year permission, but it's not clear which sector of the economy is being targeted and who will come for four years knowing there is no option to stay longer. Life can change a great deal in four years. Um, and, and we need to address those questions and have answers to them, have scenarios so that we know what people know what they're getting themselves into. And also we get back to housing again. Where will people be housed with what rights? Um, on a positive note, it would require businesses to constantly train new staff and, and succession plan, which perhaps is something that has not happened and not helped with population on the island. Now, the 10 year permission could be said to be clearer that it enables the possibility of extension and long term residency. And I have no problem with this for essential workers. It is in many ways like we, what we have now. But will it be the government or the advisory board that decides upon this demographic? And if there is a demand for business or services, will there be a growth in population? Uh, and there is also no detail on the proportion of each type of permission. So we have a tiered system that you know, one could call it a caste system based upon economic value, uh, a very British attitude, attitude, one might say. And what about those who are already living? What about? All, uh, sorry, so there's an echo. Yes, and what about those who are already living their lives in Jersey? We have had the process of registration for settled status, meaning that many who have worked and paid tax in Jersey for many years have had to go through the administrative process and found it. Some have found it unpleasant, uh, an insult, to be quite frank, but gone along because they've understood. But where do where do the lives of these people fit into this document? And I would like an answer from the proposer, please. What about those who are already living here and what are the implications? Um, and I know that there'll be many that will not be at ease with a system that could create and um, probably will create second and third right members of our society. And this is a real risk. Um, and it is the detail that needs to be addressed so that we can be reassured that that won't happen. Uh, we will, I'm certain here that this policy will address the problems of housing. It does not deal with the housing crisis. Is issues with housing, availability, the quality have much wider causes than simply the numbers. Indeed, 
the theoretical numbers will not change, just the people filling the vacancies who will be a more transient population. The question is whether this will further drive up, drive up rents as contract change more, option, more often and the opportunity to increase rents uh, goes with it. There is so much more that's causing our housing crisis. The concentrations of homes in the hands of developers and investors is a fundamental cause and will not go away with this change to migration policy. I'm also concerned that this is designed to simply gain the headline that the government is addressing migration before the next election. And that is simply wrong. This is too serious a subject, too important politically, morally and for the future of Jersey. So if this is agreed, there needs to be full development and consultation with states members to ensure the long term implications are seen. We have a context of Brexit and COVID recovery, which must be accounted for as we develop policies. I note the concerns expressed by some sectors of our economy already. Um, and I do not have much faith in the development of a government IT systems, which seems to be over budget and late regardless of what happens. There needs to be openness about the underlying political influences that drive this policy and a willingness to change if it is not appropriate. We have the bare bones of a possible migration policy here, full of uncertainty with a huge lack of clarity. The report does look like a last minute dissertation produced for a deadline that suddenly became real with a word count that needed fulfilling. Uh, 379 pages of material with so little specific detail, it is quite a piece of work. Um, I would suggest to the uh, proposal that we seem to be replacing a, le a so-called leaky tap with a brochure of taps and remain undecided on what tap to purchase. So voting for this will leave me uneasy for the reasons I've outlined. But voting against will mean that we have no movement on tackling the issue of migration. The Council of Ministers have left it with an inadequate choice because it has been left too late and too close to the election. And too many assembly members of the past have failed to address this issue and, and who now complain about the lack of action. So I look forward to the debate and will listen for the answers to all of these issues I have raised. And I would expect the proposer to answer the questions that I've asked. And I urge members to think very, very closely um, and, and really engage it before voting on this uh, uh, proposition. Thank you, sir. Deputy Senator Pallet. Thank you, sir. And I'm pleased to um, to follow Deputy Ward because, as usual, he's done his research and he's, uh, I think, brought up a lot of uh, very clear issues that um, uh, I think we need to look at in, in more detail. I'm sure that members will. Um, but sir, I'm sure that members will have had the opportunity to consider the review carried out uh, on P137 by the Migration and Population Review Panel that uh, I was pleased to chair. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not going to go into any great detail in regard to the findings and recommendations, uh, as I think they speak for themselves, but it's important to recognise uh, the diverse views given by a broad range of stakeholders on P137. I believe that many members like myself uh, and that of the members of the Migration and Policy Review Scrutiny Panel have received many concerns in regards to P137 from both businesses and individuals who may be impacted by these new migration controls. These concerns have been wide ranging and cover all aspects of P137. But one comment made by Jersey Finance that concern would lie around the clarity and application of the policy and permission process. Some of the views that many of many of the stakeholders who have made submissions to the panel hold. Although Jersey Finance, amongst others, thought it sensible to provide more responsive controls and to remove automatic graduation, when commenting on, on around the lack of visibility and data around how people move across sectors under the current controls, they were concerned that the new controls could be cutting off a pipeline that will ultimately not solve the problem of increased population. There are concerns, there is, there is actually not a long queue of migrant workers, whether skilled or otherwise, who want to move to Jersey and that time limited permits may cause issues to those considering coming to work in the island, especially to partners of workers and their families who would not only have the upheaval of moving, but for some partners who might also have an impact on their own careers. I think it would be fair to say though that the general consensus of those who've responded to our call for evidence during the um, uh, panel's review uh, of P137 was that there is a need for both migration controls and a common population policy. Citizens advice echoed other comments that the current controls 
are not having the desired effect in controlling population levels. The new controls we are debating today and any new population policy must though, both be based on up to date evidence and data and, polic and policies that need to be nimble and flexible to ensure that local business can access the labour force it requires when it needs it. I think many of us would agree that the levels of migration seen in recent years of a thousand plus a year are unsustainable and are putting increased pressure on services such as health and education. The issue that is being called into question is what these controls need to look like and how and when they are applied. Only on Monday I was contacted by the Chamber of Commerce in regards to serious concerns their members have in regards to comments uh, included in the forward of P137. The highlighted comments of the Chief Minister mentioned were, our focus in 2021 will be on developing the migration control proposals. Existing new, new and new controls will be rigorously applied during this time to prevent a new influx of migrant workers as job opportunities start to become available again. This for me makes it clear that should these migration controls be adopted by this assembly this year, then the flow of migrant workers could be limited at a time when the concerns of chamber members around the impacts of COVID and Brexit have not been fully assessed. The forward also stated that initial estimates suggest that the number of workers has fallen several thousand between the summer of 2019 and summer of 2020. And it is likely that migration is likely con to continue to be depressed during 2021 due to both COVID and Brexit. I think it's worrying therefore that we think uh, that we could be introducing rigorous controls at the same time that migration is likely to be depressed during 2021. Businesses in the island need certainty and need our support to see them through the very rough economic waters that we're currently sailing through and inconsistencies such as these are a real concern to business locally. These concerns are understandable and clarity is required from government as to how and when new controls will be applied. There is no doubt that many sectors of local business have suffered greatly, especially during the two periods of lockdown. Introduced quite rightly to, to reduce the limit of the impact of the pandemic. The timing of restrictions is not a debate for today, but the consequences have been dramatic on many parts of our local economy. And we're at a point when we, when we need as an assembly to fully support our economic recovery. No necessary hurdles should be put in the way of that recovery in coming months. And there is a potential that both the new immigration controls and the new suite of migration controls could impact that recovery if applied too severely and if not carefully monitored. Our understanding of the impact of Brexit has not been has not yet fully understood. In particular, how any recent changes to migration rules might impact those who seek to work in the island and the employers who need to recruit these migrant workers and their ability to, to, to survive have yet to be uh, assessed. All of these issues are interlinked. And we should be in a position where, it, where we fully understand how one affects the other before any further changes are made to our current housing and work controls. The Jersey Hospitality Association have made their concerns known very widely and believe the new immigration controls are the most significant change to control factors introduced in decades. Access to free moving individuals who could have come into the island without a border permission have been reduced by 85% as a result of Brexit. And this is already presenting acute challenges for the sector. Their work permit scheme contained in 1P7 is setting out, to, is setting out to achieve, and frankly, that may not, may or may not be the case, but it does highlight the need to ensure that migration figures can be accurately monitored as soon as possible to ensure that local businesses are not disadvantaged when looking to recruit the necessary workforce. The JHA also make the point that these migration controls were developed pre-COVID and pre-Brexit. So some consideration should be made as to the impacts of both on these proposals and the potential timing for any implementation of new controls. To implement fairly and transparently, 
both new migration controls and a new population policy uh, and a new population policy, it's vital that we have all the necessary information, not only to inform the development of proposals prior to the implementation, implementation of any new policy, but it's also vital to have the ability to measure and record any impact that either policy will have on both controlling the size of Jersey's population and the flow of migrant workers in and out of the island. Being able to set controls that take change that, that take changes in the local economy and factors outside our control into account will be vital if we are to have a thriving economy. And to do this, government need accurate data on the current population and, and data on the needs of local business. In the public hearing with the Chief Minister, the panel were told that an agile IT system was being developed to provide data that is currently not available. This is vital to ensure that data is available to inform decision making and to insist and to assist the independent statutory expert panel in their work. This IT system must be able to accurately record the data required, including the movement of labour both in and out of the island, and as importantly, between sectors in the island. Government will also need the information from the census that will take place in late March this year to develop its population policy. And it has been stated publicly that this information will not be available until early 22. To accurately measure migration in and out of the island, government are committed to implementing this new IT system. And without its implementation, it will be difficult to understand how any new proposals could be adequately measured. This IT system, new IT system will not be online until the end of 2021. And without its development, it will be impossible to judge whether any new controls are working, be, the un be they under the new immigration controls or any new work permit system set as set out in P137. Looking individually at both a new population policy and any new work permit controls, there is certainty as to when either can be delivered, uncertainty as to when either can be delivered. The time frame for a new population policy that should be based on sound evidence and data will rely on the availability of information, both from the census and the development of any new IT system. In terms of new migration controls, these should not be introduced until we can measure and record the data, and that can only be achieved when we have systems in place. As I've said, it is also potentially harmful to local business if existing controls are applied too rigorously under either the existing or, or new migration controls. So government need to be and should be flexible in their approach to employment of migrant workers, at least until we have fully understood the ex effects of Brexit and new immigration controls. And we have an IT system in place to fully record the impact of any changes that we are making. Looking at part C of P137, in particular uh, parts one to four, for some sectors of the economy, such as agriculture, construction and hospitality, it is unclear as to how the new work permit system, uh, new work permit policy will either provide the workforce they require or what cost will be incurred under the new controls to their businesses. The lack of clarity needs to be addressed. And if not dealt with as part of P137, then the detail will have to be provided as part of developing the necessary legislation. P137 has been described and, and is described as an in-principle proposition as it sets the vision for new migration controls. But to work in practice, it will require the changes to be enshrined in law. And to do this, a further proposition will be required setting out the law behind the proposals. When the necessary law drafting has been done, then any legislation will again be reviewed by the Migration and Population Scrutiny Panel. And we have no doubt that at that time, all the necessary detail will be required, not only by scrutiny, by, but by the Assembly itself, if it is to be agreed. This detail will clearly have to set out how each permission will in practice work for each sector. And if discretion will be is, is to be allowed for any sector such as agriculture, hospitality and construction to allow for their specific needs, that detail needs to be provided. To, brief, to briefly touch on other uh, elements of the proposition, 
The panel agrees that the enhanced criminal record checks should be introduced for migrant workers and the identity requirements uh, for all permit cards uh, should also be enhanced. But this needs to be done fairly and not be discriminatory in any way. The panel is supportive of the need for an independent statutory expert panel to be set up that is diverse, and we've just discussed this this morning, it needs to be diverse and representative of Jersey's population in its nature. This independent panel should be key to informing the Chief Minister and Council of Ministers in the development of the new population policy, but should also be key to monitoring how migration controls are working and whether such controls should be dialed up or down based on various issues, including the vibrancy or not of the local economy. It is important that this panel is independent and will listen to the views of all stakeholders, including representative bodies such as the Chamber of Commerce, when considering whether controls that are in place at any one time are working or whether they need to be reviewed. Any potential changes could be sector specific or look more generally at migration issues, but the implementation of this independent panel is of utmost importance if we are to ensure that controls are reviewed regularly and are in, in the best interests of the island generally. The panel, the independent panel, should be seen to provide the same level of guidance that, for example, the fiscal policy panel provide to government, which should show members the level of importance that government should give to population and migration issues moving forward. It is the importance of this panel that was at the forefront of the panel's decision to lodge an amendment to P137 that requested that the State's Assembly approve the membership of the independent panel. I want to take this opportunity to thank both the Chief Minister and the Privileges and Procedures Committee for their helpful comments on the Third Amendment, which has led to the panel withdrawing uh, their, their, their amendment. We only had a very short period to consider an amendment and accept, and accept that the process to appoint, uh, to appoint the panel, a process overseen by the Jersey Appointments Commission is adequately robust. The last section of Part C of P137 provides for a committee of states members to be responsible for determining applications under the Control of Housing and Work Law in a similar way that HAYWAG, the Housing and Work Advisory Group, do now. We support the need for, uh, for this group. We, we support the need for this new group that is more diverse in membership than at present and includes non-executive states members, as is the case with PPC and other states bodies. This new committee should also include, where appropriate, input from representative organisations such as the Chamber and, and Jersey Business to ensure that the impacts of any decision on a business are fully explored and appreciated. I have no doubt that some members will be concerned about new housing and work controls being implemented at a time when new immigration controls have only just be, been introduced as a result of Brexit and the world is still experiencing the impacts of the pandemic. The panel's view is that there will be further opportunities to consider and review whether the controls contained within P137 are appropriate when the legislation is brought back to the State's Assembly for debate later this year. The Migration and Population Review Panel will continue meeting and consider when further reviews are required, whether it's the, whether it's the necessary le uh, re legislation or the work to develop a new population policy. Some now hold the view that it's unlikely that there will be a long queue of workers to come to Jersey to work when travel reopens, and that we do need to provide an attractive destination for any migrant workers and, uh, and their families whether they are highly skilled or less skilled. All migrant workers, irrespective of what job they do, contribute to the financial well-being of the island and should be welcomed into our community. Policy development moving forward needs to have both European Human Rights and United Nations Rights of the Child Conventions at their forefront. Limiting the ability of partners and children to accompany migrant workers will likely see Jersey fall foul of these conventions. But more importantly, it will potentially have a huge impact on the family lives of migrant workers who move here, especially those that are less skilled and poorer. The Children's Commissioner suggests in her evidence to the panel that this policy 
fails to protect the family life of migrant workers and fails to meet the expectations of international law and conventions. And frankly, I tend to agree. We should accept that to get the best and most committed migrants, it is vital to respect, promote and protect the private and family lives of our migrant workers. We should be promoting Jersey as a jurisdiction that promotes good practice and a welcoming place for migrants to come, a place that supports family life, puts children first and provides health care that is not discriminatory. To be clear, I will be voting in favour of P137, as we do need to have the necessary mechanisms to limit migration. But to some degree, I do so holding my nose, as there is an enormous amount of work still required to get these controls over the line, and an awful lot of detail, as Deputy Ward has always suggested, an awful lot of detail that's still required. I will want to see how these controls work in the future, how they will work practically. And this is a view that was shared by many throughout the review. Business owners in agriculture, hospitality and construction still need clarity how the proposed work permit scheme will work for them. For agriculture, there are major concerns around cost and how certain skills can be properly recognised within the nine month, four year and 10 year permission scheme. The panel as part of its review made a number of recommendations to the Chief Minister. And we're pleased that the first two have been accepted and have led to the additional information provided to members uh, on Monday. We as a panel appreciate the efforts that officers have gone to in providing this information, but I still believe there is some confusion that still exists over the relationship between the immigration permits and the, house, the, and the potential new housing and work permits. If there are to be workaround, workarounds for any sector, that finds the new nine month housing and work law difficult to operate, then any discretion needs to be clearly understood and decision making seen as fair and transparent. I'm pleased that the conditional comments include a statement that, subject to the outcome of these important debates in 2021, clear policy and operational guidelines will be drawn up and published in line with the decisions that have been made and that these guidelines will ensure that businesses and workers have a full understanding of the controls and how they are being used. Because clarity is essential as businesses look to recover from the effects of Brexit and COVID. The panel will be keen to review any such guidelines as they need to provide information in a way that can be clearly understood, whether you're a one man or one woman band or a large company that have human resources available to deal with such a I wish to reassure members that we as a panel will continue to keep a very close eye on how migration controls and population policy are developed in coming months to ensure that all stakeholders, including local businesses, are properly consulted with and that all controls and policy are fair and equitable. I just briefly want to take the opportunity to thank my panel colleagues, Deputy Ira St. Halley and Deputy Truscott and Brellards, and our, deputy, uh, our dedicated scrutiny officers for all their support, guidance and hard work during what was a short and very focused review. I also, I also want to thank the Chief Minister Chief. and Assistant Chief Minister for allowing a short deferral of the proposition to allow the panel to conclude its work. We intend to continue to work collaboratively with the Chief Minister and Assistant Chief Minister to ensure the best possible outcome for Islanders in regards to migration controls. So that they do what they set out to do and support an economy that is so that is so vital in the long term prosperity of the island, both financially and socially. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Senator, Senator Farnham. Um, thank you, sir. And I'm very pleased to follow Senator Pallett. He has a, a, a strong grasp of the um, economic uh, importance of what we're debating today. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to work with him for the last six years and um, he has front. We both have frontline experience of the challenges faced in that time by some of our key industry sectors. And ironically, as I think the senator alluded to, Brexit may well prove to have been 
uh, enough to limit um, Im immigration in in the longer term. So the flow of staff from the EU has been absolutely crucial to maintaining a, 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 a flow of really good people to come in and work uh, and live in Jersey sir, um, and work for our key industries. And we have to continue to access um, good people. We cannot underestimate the problems and challenges that will be created if we don't. And I think Brexit is, is going to be a major issue because we will still be able to access um, people from outside the common travel area. But of course, the process will be completely different. It, it will be a similar process to the work permit scheme um, we have now, or, 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 and we have to work hard to make sure um, it is as, uh, as easy as possible to continue to provide that flow of, of work uh, of good people with, with relevant skills to come and, and contribute to our economy and to island life. Uh, the, um, the the idea behind this is this is something that has been discussed for a long term is to actually um, well and don't forget this was discussed prior to Brexit was to actually increase the flow of labour to those um, uh, those businesses and sectors that need it whilst reducing pressure on the long term impact of our of our population. Uh, at the moment, businesses have to apply for permissions and they are limited by the number of registered um, permissions they can have. Um, of course, they can employ any number of, of, of locally qualified um, people, but of course there are there are pressures in uh, in the labour market with, with certain sectors um, being the preferred choice, which means that tourism, agriculture, retail do rely on imported labour. So I, I would hope that this scheme can lead to the nine month, the four year, the 10 year with caveats there because there are um, there are ways to um, extend for staff that become crucial sir, to extend the permissions. And but what it means is that we should be able to access many more people um, to come and work in those industries that will, will many more than perhaps permissions granted now, but of course the difference is they won't be able to, um, not all of them will be able to stay. So of course some will, will stay, um, want to make Jersey their home or will meet or, or, or marry local people or will just progress and become skilled and essential and essential employees and will eventually go to the 10 year process and become and become qualified. But I see this as, as, a, as a positive set to increase the flow of labour to those markets whilst not whilst not um, putting undue pressure on the long term population issues. Of course, I'm extremely concerned following Brexit that um, the it's going to be much harder to draw from the European market with the new um, restrictions in place or the new processes in place, but we have to work hard to um, alleviate those as much as we can. So and of course, this is all this all has to be connected to um, many other key social policies, not least housing, so because it is absolutely not just essential, but um, uh, vital that uh, people coming to live and work in Jersey that bring families can be accommodated um, uh, properly, sir. And, uh, um, and I don't envy the housing, the new housing minister, sir, but I know that um, he's thinking about these sort of challenges already. So I just want to um, say, sir, that notwithstanding Brexit and the additional challenges, this brings to us. I see this as um, in, in the medium to long term, at least once the, the, the world has settled down following Brexit. I hope it will be a positive thing because it will enable businesses, albeit on nine month permits or four year, nine month permissions, four year permissions to, to, to actually eventually get more staff in to, to manage their businesses. Uh, and again, with a, undue pressure on the long term, which is the ultimate goal and of which this is just one of the first debates we're going to have. Thank you. Very much, Senator Senator Moore. Thank you, sir. And uh, I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to Senator Pallett and the members of the review panel who have produced an excellent report. Uh, and Senator Pallett gave an, an excellent and wide-ranging speech uh, 
uh, I agree with um, most of the points. Uh, although, unfortunately, I, I, I do uh, conclude um, that I myself cannot uh, support uh, the majority of this uh, proposition, sir, and I will only be voting for Part B as amended. Um, so it is my view um, that the um, removal of automatic graduation is inappropriate and particularly so at this time. And uh, I, I feel deeply uncomfortable by some of the proposals uh, of this policy, uh, particularly the introduction of the nine month uh, permissions. Uh, and um, I, I very much struggle to um, see that the relevant um, uh, industries have been consulted. Uh, in fact, we, we, we know and it is very clear that uh, industries such as agriculture and construction have not been adequately consulted in this process and therefore greater thought is needed. This is about timing and um, I will support part B because I believe it is correct to have and to um, a robust policy uh, on this important matter and to then implement the controls once that policy has been properly defined. Uh, I find it abhorrent, sir, that the children's rights impact assessment has not been conducted by a government who purports to uh, put children first. Um, that should have been one of the very first acts to have been completed uh, in this piece of work. And, and it is deeply disappointing that it has not been done. Uh, and if members have not seen the submissions of the Children's Commissioner to um, the Migration Review Panel, then I would really suggest that they um, take a look before they vote on this matter today, sir. Um, Deputy Ward, described this as a caste system based on economic value. Um, and, and I have to say, I do with regret um, identify with that description. Uh, I think that uh, sense of what was coming uh, became very clear when we saw the estimating government receipts and expenditure for Jersey households report, uh, which was produced by the government in February 2019. That certainly set the stall out in terms of um, what the government considered to be uh, important criteria uh, for those living in the island. Uh, and, and that most certainly does appear to be based on who, who contributes uh, in terms of financial contributions to the revenue of the public purse uh, and totally disregards the other important contributions that people make as individual members of a community uh, in terms of skills, in terms of demeanour, in terms of diversity that we have all spoken about so um, so passionately over the course of the past day or so. Uh, so there are, as Senator Pallet highlighted, uh, many uh, uncertainties at this time. And as Senator Farnham just said, um, it is harder potentially to draw people to the island in this post-Brexit, post-pandemic or uh, pandemic or time of pandemic. Um, we know, sir, that already many islanders are finding the island unaffordable and we are seeing people leaving the island taking with them their skills that we desperately need and um, because they seek to uh, find a more affordable life for themselves and their families elsewhere and we are struggling to find people with the relevant skills that we need important skills in healthcare and in education and, and so so we need to first of all understand what skills we need here, how we can encourage people to, to live here and achieve an excellent quality of life for all and especially for children um, who do not have the same choice uh, that economic migrants um, themselves have. There are also impacts on single people 
And we often see people um, marrying uh, or, or taking important decisions uh, because of the restrictions that um, housing um, places upon them. And so all of these things need to be taken into account properly uh, so that we can have a considered and careful policy, um, not measures such as are being proposed today by this government. So, sir, um, I, I look forward to hearing the rest of the debate, but I will only be supporting Part B. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Deputy St Martin. Uh, thank you, sir. So I think it's a bit of an understatement to say that the general consensus across the island is that there's a need for both migration controls and a new population policy. And along with housing, those subjects are probably the most discussed amongst islanders. But so I think everybody's going to agree that it's vital that both these policies, immigration and population, whenever they come in front of us, must be based on up-to-date evidence and relevant current data. Almost everyone's going to agree that the levels of migration seen in recent years of over a thousand per annum are unsustainable and they're putting increased pressure on all our services and infrastructure and something needs to be done. However, there's no doubt that many sectors of local business have suffered greatly in the last 12 months and especially during the two extended periods of the COVID pandemic lockdown. Looking at the responses to the scrutiny review, it's very clear that many of these businesses believe that the timing of both introduction of restrictions and their withdrawal were not fully thought through and may well have unnecessarily damaged local business. Um, and we're far from back to work yet, sir. We don't know who remains to fill the jobs that we hopefully will see coming back online and available very soon. And then there's Brexit. Clearly the impact of Brexit has not yet been fully understood. In particular, we do not yet know exactly how many changes will impact those who are both seeking work and employers who need to recruit their workforce from outside the island. Both of these issues, Brexit and COVID, are interlinked and it's vital that we fully understand how one affects the other and how we are going to get our economy going again before any major changes are made to our current migration controls. I'm clear that no unnecessary hurdles should be put in the way of Jersey's economic recovery in the coming months and that any new immigration controls that could impact that recovery if applied too severely should be resisted. We need to tread very, very carefully. Government must have accurate data on the current population, the size of the local workforce and the movement of labour both in and out of the island before any final decisions are made. Government will also need all the information from the census to develop its population policy. So the Chief Minister tells us regularly that he acts on data, but he cannot have the required information to make the decisions on population at this current time. New migration controls should not be introduced until we have accurate baseline information. Do we know the effects of Brexit? Do we know the effects of COVID? I would venture to suggest that we do not. The devil in the detail of any proposed policy, which will come to this assembly at some time in the future, will clearly have to set out how each permission will work in practice for each sector of the economy. And if any discretion will be allowed for specific sectors, such as agriculture, hospitality and construction, to allow for their particular needs. So it's likely there will soon not be a long queue of workers looking to come to Jersey. That might be because of Brexit, COVID, the exchange rate, our cost of living, a host of reasons. So we do need to continue to provide an attractive destination for any migrant worker and their families, whether they are highly skilled or less skilled. It's clear to me that all migrant workers contribute to the financial well-being of the island and they should all be welcomed into our community. But we do need to have the right controls in place. 
And then, sir, I come to the issue of a reducing population. So a falling population can result in significant social and economic challenges. A shrinking labour force, a lowering of the tax base, so all of those make it more difficult to us to maintain roads, schools, medical facilities and other public services, which in turn makes it difficult to attract those new immigrants that I've just been talking about. And for that matter, prevent islanders from moving elsewhere. And continued migration from Jersey will in turn disrupt social ties by separating people from their friends and their families. With few people paying our various taxes, there would be less money to spend on those public services and healthcare facilities. But maybe more importantly, private businesses, including small shops, restaurants and other establishments, are just less likely to operate. That in turn leads to a reduced standard of living. And at the same time, our population continues to age and increases the need for medical attention and their other specific public services. <coughs> Excuse me. And now let's briefly, very briefly, consider the loss of young people from our island. Most people leaving small communities such as ours are either young adults between the ages of 17 and 24 or families with young children. Although they leave for a variety of reasons, the most common to attend university may be to find jobs or just to escape the cost of living or specifically the cost of housing in Jersey, which is getting greater and greater and more onerous on families exchequers. The loss of young people and families, those that do not return, has far reaching consequences for communities such as ours. Young men and women, those who stay or those who go away and come back, who would normally become part of our local workforce, establish their own local businesses or just generally contribute to island life. If they go, then they have instead exported their talents and energies elsewhere. Without younger generations to replace the older ones, it will eventually become even more difficult to run this island, and that is putting it mildly. Sensible controls on the ability of anyone to come to the island are important, but we just cannot go too far or make things too restrictive. Depleted of our young generations, we will be left with an increasingly ageing population. Although populations on the whole are growing older, I accept that, the change is occurring much more rapidly in communities such as ours as our population continues to age and if our young people and families continue to leave, the labour force will shrink even further and push local businesses and our economy into a deep decline. At the same time, the ageing population places greater demands on the already limited healthcare facilities and all this on top of COVID and Brexit. I'll leave it there, sir. We all complain about the increasing population and the effects of more and more people on our infrastructure. But, and I cannot stress this enough, the challenges we face with an increasing population are by far the best type of population problems we face. The alternative, a decreasing population and the problems I've just outlined would make the issues we currently face look small and insignificant. I'm going to vote for this proposition today, but I'm not particularly happy to do so because it's so vague. But I will be looking very, very closely at the detail when it comes back. We have to do something to tighten up. I accept that. But keeping it working, economically buoyant, happy, content, beautiful, and a place that others want to visit is my priority. Let's move forward, work together on this, Let's keep human migration low, but let's keep the economy functioning successfully. Most importantly, let's see the effects of Brexit and COVID before we make any decisions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy. Um, Deputy Morrell, you have a question for the Attorney General? Yes, thank you, sir, if you don't mind. Yep. Um, it's, I believe the Attorney General might be able to help. It's with regard to um, part C of the proposition. The question I'd like to ask is, should part C pass today, sir? Um, does the States of Jersey law or any other law 
bind the chief minister to bring back legislation which details all those parts, which includes the detail of all those parts of Part C. So the nine month permission, the four year permissions and so on and so forth. Um, would the chief minister, should Part C be passed, would the chief minister have any room in which to change those parts? So for instance, he may wish to bring back uh, a 12 month permission instead of a nine month permission. But would that I, I think I can assist um, on that deputy um, because it is a matter of construction in part of the proposition itself and that's a matter for the presiding officer. Um, C is to request the Chief Minister to bring forward. Chief Minister therefore does not have to meet that request. That uh, is the consequence of not doing so may be political consequences but there aren't legal consequences because he's merely been requested and um, if he comes back with a different uh, with a different type of um, rule or regulation, then if that's justified to the assembly, presumably the assembly will be content that, with that variation. Thank you, sir. So there is no law in the states of Jersey, nor no aspect which binds the minister to carry out the propositions. Uh, well, all I've done is construe the proposition. I can't go further than that. Um, so I'll ask the attorney if he wishes to add anything to that from a legal perspective. Thank you, sir. So it's the Solicitor General and uh, no, thank you very much. I have nothing that I'd wish to add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does any other member wish to speak on the proposition? Right, Arbus and John. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, it has been my very great privilege to work on and chair the Housing and Work Advisory Group uh, and during that time, uh, I became aware of the shortcomings of the current uh, immigration policy and the current housing and work laws. It's generally accepted that the population is increasing too rapidly uh, and that in turn means that a stricter uh, immigration policy is needed. The frustration on the Housing and Work Advisory Group, HAYWAG, uh, was the lack of control. Permissions would be given, but there wasn't the ability to tr retract permissions so easily. And what had happened was we ended up giving registered permissions, which pro in turn progressed to entitled permissions once that person had been here five years. Invariably, that business would lose that employee, but they would maintain the registered permission and so simply imported another person to employ in place of the person who has left, having gained entitled qual uh, qualifications. And that was that progression which uh, was very ably um, demonstrated to us uh, by Duncan uh, from the um, statistics unit and it became known as the Duncan Shuffle and he illustrated that extremely well and it showed how the workforce coming to the island as a registered worker moved to entitled worker and there was no means of controlling that. This uh, proposition is to give greater control and I think that that is the importance it is not necessarily to decrease or increase the population. It is to give greater control so that we are able to increase the level of migration if it is needed, as well as decrease it if it is not required. There was something else, sir, that concerned me considerably on the HAYWAG committee, and that was that many businesses came requesting for a license for a registered worker. The reason was purely financial. Because employing a registered worker meant that they could pay a significantly lower wage, wage than an entitled person. And that, sir, was discriminatory and it made me feel extremely uncomfortable because a business should pay a proper wage and it was people with 
business models that weren't working that resulted in many applications to the HAYWAG committee. It's been suggested that we currently don't have a nine month permission and is a nine month permission correct? We do have a nine month permission at the moment because many agricultural permits are nine month registered permits. So there's nothing new in that. There was also a criticism, sir, that the agricultural industry hadn't been consulted. Well, the chairman of Jersey Dairy was full of praise for the policy migration panel because he said nobody had ever consulted him so intensely before. So I would uh, strongly refute that allegation. Jersey needs to do something to uh, improve its migration control. I think that this is a good way forward and it will give us the control, the greater level of control that we need. There are two particularly important aspects. One is that we will be able to now check the criminal backgrounds or lack of criminal backgrounds of individuals coming to the island. That is important. And secondly, we will be able to uh, hopefully uh, welcome those who come to Jersey wanting to be part of our community, to welcome them into our community on a full time basis. So this is an in principle debate and it is the principle of introducing a different mechanism. Uh, the deputy of St Peter described it as two leaky taps and we, we are replacing it with a, a new set of taps and that is precisely sir what it is. And I would urge members to support this because it is a positive way forward for the island going forward. Thank you. sir. Thank you very much. Um, deputy Martin, do you have a point of order that you wish to raise? Well, I'll put it in chat, sir. Um, you asked if anyone else wanted to speak. The Constable St John said he did, and then Deputy Morell did, and then there was three, two or three other speakers, and then Deputy Morell has said, uh, ignore his request to speak. I put in chat, is that not to speak at this debate? Because people are sitting on hands. We do it in the assembly. We need to do it on chat, but basically I'm asking, what's the ruling, sir? It may not be a point of order, but I think it is. Well, I'm, I'm not sure there's a ruling that I can usefully make. The reality of it is that if we were sitting in the state's assembly, members would put on their lights. I would call on the next one um, uh, in, in the old way, and then um, it would be up to members whether they put on their lights again after the person has spoken. And there can be a number of reasons why individuals choose to stop, um, indicate no that they don't want to speak uh, then or in the debate at all, or indeed at that point. Um, I understand from looking at the chat, Deputy Morella suggested that the reason he wished to, to defer was that he wished to conduct some further research. Um, I think it must be open to people, uh, and I would not wish to see it being abused, um, of course, that uh, people said that they wished to speak and then thought on reflection they needed to check something or look it up and didn't want to be called on for that purpose and to withdraw it. I don't think that precludes them from seeking to speak later in the debate. The risk that individuals run if they sit on their hands, and I entirely take that point, Deputy Martin, is that I will say the debate is closed and it'll be too late. And we've done that on more than one occasion in the past. But I don't think I can rule any further than that, I'm afraid. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Minister. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, I was wondering if I might have virtually uh, dropped my paperwork to allow somebody else to go in front of me, but there we go, sir. Um, on a serious note, um, can I start off sir, by thanking the entire uh, team that has put so much work into getting us to this stage, sir? And by that I um, reference absolutely the members of the original Policy Development Board, um, which you'll see as we've heard, sir, as the Conantarp St John, uh, Deputy Martin, sir, Deputy Young, uh, Senator Ferguson, and the Deputy of St Peter, sir, there are three other members of the public who gave their time voluntarily uh, during a quite a long process um, who I 
presume it's not appropriate to name directly, sir, uh, but they one was from obviously the Chamber of Commerce as nominated and one at that point was nominated by the Institute of Directors as well. Um, but I absolutely do commend uh, the work that they did. I certainly want to place great credit to the Commonwealth Harbour St John for all the work he did in leading that panel. Deputy Martin uh, did the final wrap up and then uh, the Deputy St Peter um, uh, was a willing volunteer, or at least he was when I asked him, uh, to take this work forward. And I very much uh, commend his work as well to the Assembly. And I'm looking at the report and proposition that has been filed, sir, and at something like, I think it's 337 pages, it is a, I would suggest, an in indication of a of the thoroughness that has taken place. Uh, I'll make some um, minor points and then I'll get to the, the number of it, sir. Um, the minor points are obviously uh, with some in agreement, vehement agreement with some speakers who've talked about uh, the need for uh, better data, which we have absolutely recognised as one of, the, one of the pieces of work that actually came out uh, came out of the work that's been done. Uh, and in that instance, uh, as we said, in terms of the IT systems, the project manager is in place and the implementation is still scheduled uh, at present for completion for this year. And then that will give uh, the responsive information and data to enable future assemblies uh, as that policy develops uh, to make and assess uh, the impact of cross population policies. I'm also looking ahead in about five years, wherever, uh, and um, and then how they can be made more effective going forward. And I think also to be clear, we've not been sector specific in any of the permits. We've listened uh, and the panels have listened. I think uh, Conrad Harbour St John has referenced that very some other members. Um, uh, but uh, it isn't a case of that, um, you know, uh, an agricultural worker is only on nine months and a banker is only on four years. For the sake of argument, uh, it can be applied across to whatever is flexible to the uh, to the set, uh, to the individual uh, applicants. I make one correction, sir, which was there was reference to, I think it was one of the first reports issued by uh, this government, I believe it was the expression or the government, which I assume is reference to the um, uh, report, which is entitled. Uh, estimating government receipts and expenditure for Jersey households. That was actually a report issued uh, by or produced uh, by the uh, um, Statistics Jersey. So it's not strictly speaking a government report, although we have also incorporated it because it was, was work commissioned in anticipation of um, uh, the data, some uh, putting some data together where data didn't previously exist. Um, if I uh, the Assembly does, but if the Assembly votes for this proposition today, it will represent a very, in my view, a very significant step forward in um, identifying a robust set of controls over population. But let's be clear, if we as politicians uh, want to live to our commitments of starting to tackle population, and uh, if that means being able to reduce the growth, for example, that has taken place over the last five years, I'm also excluding 2020, sir, of over 8,000 uh, people a year, then one has to have controls. And we can then wrap the policy around that. And we can be assured then that we'll have a policy, whatever that policy is, that can be enforced. Uh, but also, we mustn't be under any illusions um, that having effective controls will involve difficult and ethical challenges because at some point it will involve having to say no. Uh, and certainly uh, and particularly so from uh, our experience as ministers uh, and even uh, and as assembly members as well over the last 12 months, saying no is difficult and it will involve having political backbone and um, and actually uh, making, and that's to speak to a, an observation by Deputy Pamplin, which, which I agree with, but making informed political decisions. And Jersey has long been recognised for, for being calm and for making calm, rational decisions. And um, I very much hope that we will continue to be in that position. And that involves having the data and the information to make those decisions, um, to base those decisions upon. Uh, I agree with much, for example, what was said by the Deputy St Martin and others um, who said about supporting our economy in what has been difficult times. And that is all about, in my view, the policies. Uh, and it also shows from all the comments that have been made how difficult the subject is. 
but today is about controls. It is the tap, and the analogy has been used a number of occasions, it's the tap that can be turned on, it can be turned off or left as it is. The policy is how much and in what direction it gets turned. And so, sir, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time further. I will be very uh, listening with great interest as to the efficacy in which the Deputy St. Peter sums up and addresses everybody's concerns in the um, uh, in, 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 as in the summary position on, on, on this debate. But I absolutely commend, uh, sir, the very thorough piece of work that have been done to get us to this point of putting controls in place. And on that basis, I hope many members will be supporting this proposition, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Minister. Deputy Massel. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, a lot of my points have been covered, so uh, I'll stick to standing orders and do my best not to repeat anything. Um, and all I really wanted to, to add, I suppose, is recalling back to um, 2018, I remember being in the audience of the St Helier number no. one hustings, and there was a, a, a young lady uh, there must have been you know, in, in between 20 and 30. She, she stood up and she put a question to the candidates and she said, you know, uh, I, I've gone away. I'm a teacher. I'm qualified. I've come back to the island because I want to want to work here. But for me, just the, the cost of living and being able to do all the other things I'd like to achieve in my life, lay down a family, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, I just don't think is going to be achievable here. And whilst I appreciate this is a debate on the um, or on the control mechanisms, it, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, isn't it? Between what the population policy and what the controls are, and we, for me, you know, I've been in this assembly almost 13, 13 years, and you know, this has been something that's been on, in my, on my manifesto every election, um, and this is something which I feel. Um, you know, something that the island has been calling out for decades, um, sir. And I appreciate absolutely what the chief minister has just said. This this will mean at some point saying no and saying perhaps saying no more often, which is obviously going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be difficult. But again, if we want to retain the people that want to be here, you know, the islanders that will want to stay here, we do need to start making these very tough political choices, uh, sir. And therefore, this proposition for me has my full backing because I think it's well overdue. Thank you, sir. Very much, Deputy. Does any other member wish to speak on the proposition? No other member wishes to speak, then I. Deputy Higgins. Thank you, sir. I'll be very brief. Um, this, as Deputy Masson has just said, is part of a policy that has been long overdue. Again, we came into the States about the same time. We know people have been going on about population for all this time, and we haven't come up with a solution because repeated governments have kicked it down the road. And it is important, it is addressed in this parliament. And what I will say is that um, many of the problems we actually have, other problems we have in the island, are directly caused by population and increased population. Now, I'm not one calling for a total ban. You can't do that, but we have to have a measured way forward. And when I talk about the problems that we have, just have a look at St. Helier. St. Helier is being piled high with apartments to try and cater for the housing needs of this island. And certain areas of St. Helier are gonna be so densely packed, it's gonna be ridiculous. So, and then we need schools, then we need uh, more services. We're talking about an 800 million pound hospital. All these things stem from the need and the increase in population over the last 13 years has been criminal, in my opinion. We've had no controls, as we've heard from the explanation of why we need these new migration um, controls. We're told we had a leaky faucet. Well, we've had it for 13 years and repeated governments have ignored it. So I'm going to support uh, this part of the migration uh, policy. But what I will say, though, is I look forward to seeing what the government is going to produce before the end of this year. And I want to see that it is robust. And can I just say something for all the special interests that have been lobbying all states members? Yes, 
We know that many of you do need employees. But many of you are bringing in cheap employees, low paid workers to make up for the fact that you're not paying reasonable wages to locals who don't want to work in your industries. So it isn't just simply population. It's about this island and the values that we hold. If we don't pay people enough, then, for example, as we were saying yesterday in some of the questions dealing with Social Security, we end up paying 30 million pounds to support rent and we're paying considerable sums of money to support other aspects of our society. We've got our values wrong. We need a total look at what we're actually doing. And one of those, and I, I make no apologies for this, we need to look at our tax system. We need to see who's paying taxes, who isn't, and try to get the balance right. So I would just say that the migration policy, yes, I will support uh, at this time, and I'll be watching very closely what's coming forward when we get more data. But as I say, all the special interest groups, yes, I know you want workers and you want the freedom to do it. Start looking at your business models. You can't always expect to get low paid workers come in and then to that add additional pressures onto our island economy and pressures in other services provided by government. So let's have a total review, not just a population review. And I'll finish with that, sir, and just say I do support this proposition. Thank you, Deputy Senator Bezek. Thank you, sir. Um, I must say, I think there have been some cracking speeches in, in this debate, um, irrespective of whether I agree with all of the conclusions of that, that all members have put forward. But um, some really have, I think, um, drilled down on some of the really important issues here. And, and, and just quickly, in response to one of the points that Deputy Higgins made towards the end of his speech there about the tax system, you might want to have a look at the answers to the written questions I got for this state sitting, which show how unfairly distributed the tax burden is spread over different income brackets in Jersey. That's another issue that um, I think too many have had their heads buried in the sand over and how by resolving our tax and spend issues and how we fund our public services properly would inevitably have a huge impact on what sorts of population policy um, we would need or how we'd need to react um, to the needs of, of businesses when they do need to bring um, skilled workers in and etc. So all these issues are interlinked. Uh, my, my corporate memory on this subject goes back to when I was first elected in the uh, by-election in March 2014, so just before the general election of that year, where the then government brought forward an interim population policy which set uh, limits. I, I, don't, I don't really know if the word limit is appropriate. Maybe it was more of a more of an aspiration uh, that uh, migration would be a, a maximum 350 a year. And the states accepted that interim population policy on the basis that there was then meant to be, um, I think just over a year after that, meant to be a full population policy that would come forward. And it never did. The interim population policy uh, eventually expired. And in the time that it was in place, the limits that it set were never reached once. And in fact, they were exceeded in some years by over three times. And it was only towards the end of that political term, the 2014 to 2018 term, that a further population policy was published, although it, it never ended up being debated in the end and was um, withdrawn, um, withdrawn in deference to this political term, the 2018 to 22 term, where we would once again convene to come up with a population policy. And here we are a year and a bit away from the end of this political term. And at this point, we're not even debating a population policy. We're debating a migration policy uh, and one which we do have to say is rather thin on detail. And so the fact that we're here with this um, it iteration of this debate having spanned over what will essentially be four political terms, because it will require this proposition requires the next council of ministers to form a common population policy. So as far as I can remember back in this subject, it's spanning four political terms with only one proposition adopted in that time 
but never actually abided by with multiple U-turns in putting the uh, population policy together that have taken place in that time. And that must surely stand as a damning indictment of our political system that it's taken so long to get to this position, so many U-turns, um, over four political terms, and here we are now debating not a population policy, but a, a migration policy. And I hope that um, people will start to get the memo that this is what you get when you've got such a rubbish political system like we do. And this debate taking place so soon after the debate on the hospital, which, which frankly has been even worse than this in its conduct. And if we want to see credible policies put in place, then we desperately need to reform how we do politics in the island so that we don't end up in the situation we've been in uh, during that time where the longer the issue has gone unresolved, the longer we've been living in a situation where we have the worst of all worlds, no real um, control, no real understanding of the implications of the policy um, that's in place uh, and no ability to um, tinker with it or, or direct it in a particular way that we think might be more in line um, with our needs as a community. And that's frustrating because it's such a fundamental subject to the well-being of our society um, in every single way. Uh, part A of this proposition, which is the, I guess the in principle bit, um, whilst I might I think perhaps have some some philosophical reservations about, it, it does make a point well that we would gain much greater control if we had the ability to um, have workers coming to the island without the uh, without the presumption that they will graduate to have um, full rights of establishment and, and work like um, the rest of us uh, do. Um, I have some philosophical difficulties with that but but it is logical it does make sense and it does give us um, greater control to um, uh, to essentially create a, a future that we can feel will have more um, uh, will be better place to deal with um, all the other associated issues. Um, but the difficulty we find ourselves in with this particular proposition, I think Deputy Ward stated it very well in his analysis early on uh, in the debate, is that there really is so little detail in this. We've got a proposal for a, a, a different um, system in terms of the nine months, the four years and the ten years, that, that's different to what we've got now um, and it, there may well be logic behind the behind those specific suggestions but when you read through the report it admits that there's so much that is not to be decided at this point and will be reviewed later on and that's to do with things like what these people's um, right to access healthcare will be when they're here, um, what rights their children will have, what, what rights they may have if their life gets turned upside down when they happen to be living in Jersey. And I have to say that that really isn't good enough to put us in that situation now. And to ask the Assembly to agree with the principle of a system which uh, doesn't allow the graduation of uh, of people to entitled status uh, is something that we probably could have got our heads around much earlier in this term and agreed on and then set the Council of Ministers on to come up with the detail so that we may, may be able to reconcile with our consciences that we're going to have people move to the island and actually be treated like human beings. And that's my concern with this. I, I simply can't um, reconcile with my conscience the idea that somebody could come here and right now I can't guarantee because of a political decision that has or hasn't been made that a person can come here and after a year get sick or end up in an accident where they're quite badly injured and won't have the full rights to healthcare without the astronomical costs that might otherwise come with it um, and be okay at the end of it. Um, I, I have no guarantees of what could happen 
if somebody comes here on, on one of these licenses um, ends up falling in love and having children with somebody what rights will those children have and what rights will they then have if that was with somebody who is entitled but then they don't get their four year um, uh, permit renewed or, or have to leave for a period of time in a really important moment in their children's life or something like that and when these moral questions remain unanswered um, I, I think that makes this debate utterly impossible how uh, this lack of detail means we can't say that we know uh, beyond any doubt that we're upholding our commitments on putting children first and um, uh, Senator Moore, I think it was, who mentioned the lack of children's rights impact assessment, that that we should have had at least some version of that at this point. Um, and when we've questioned um, government ministers in briefings, they've given some good words on that. And, and I'll, I'll credit the Deputy of St Peter, who when I asked him about these issues, he gave an answer that um, I think aligned with my particular values on it. But that's all it was. It was an answer in a briefing, not something that's featured in the wording of this proposition and not something that we can guarantee will feature in the legislation, the legislation further on down the line. And so I think we've been let down by this process for that reason. And um, there are businesses that have raised concerns about their ability um, to recruit and uh, and that that will be understandable and there will be extremely difficult things to weigh up there because there does have to be a point at which you say to a business, no, you can't do this because it, it may well be in your business's interest, but it's not in the interest of the wider community. Um, and, and from my time serving on Haywag, I know how difficult um, uh, that, that can be sometimes, uh, but it's important to listen to those concerns anyway. Um, so, sir, um, perhaps far less articulately than others have in this debate, I wanted to put those um, those points on record that it really isn't good enough when we're talking ultimately about human beings and their lives to put something before us that accepts the principle of these particular types of um, work permits or law licensing arrangements whatever you want to call them which will then set off the full weight of the civil service to go ahead and begin uh, preparing for and putting that um, work together without us having given a clear and unambiguous um, declaration of what we will expect for these people and their rights when they're here, to know that when they're coming to the island that they will have the absolute uh, best on offer, will feel that it's worth coming here to work and know what understanding they're doing that um, on the basis. And for us to risk then getting even closer to the end of this political term and having to rush something through or having, having to put up with something second rate because at that point, the alternative will be we proceed with nothing. And then where will we end up then? Perhaps this issue spreading over five or six political terms because we couldn't have dealt with it properly. And so, so sir, I, I think the Assembly really is in a bad position with this proposition. I hope members will think very um, carefully about how they vote on it. Uh, I hope that the uh, proposer will take this in uh, different um, parts so that he can get an understanding of what strength of feeling there is and what actions he will have to take to address those concerns rather than just score a, a cheap political victory um, uh, through a different parliamentary tactic and um, so I asked him to consider doing that um, and I, I hope members will have gone through this experience understanding how broken our political system is that ends up putting such inadequate propositions in front of us like this on such an important issue and that's all I've got to say, sir. Very much, Thomas. Deputy IA. Thank you, sir. This proposition is not, as some had hoped for, a form of immigration control. It is only a framework for changes to the control of housing and work law, which may provide a mechanism for controlling the level of migration in the future. It is not a population policy which is what we have all been waiting for, and which we may yet have to wait for a good deal longer. That said, it is imperative that the new permissions are clearly defined so that both business owners and those coming to seek work 
are fully aware of the regulations and how they will be affected. Given that this is a census year, one wonders whether this proposal could have been delayed until that vital information had been collated. Another unknown is the extent to which Brexit will impact our ability to attract seasonal workers. And if this ability is greatly diminished, it will have a damaging effect on the hospitality industry, which relies so heavily on this resource. There is also the COVID factor to consider. Work practices are changing dramatically in response to the pandemic, and it is possible that many businesses will choose to take advantage of this new reliance on working remotely rather than seek licenses to relocate workers from elsewhere. All of these developments should have a bearing on a well-considered migration policy, and it is of concern that we may be putting the cart before the horse in not passing a population policy first. Concerns have been raised by some businesses about the inflexibility of the new work permissions. Specifically, it has been queried whether discretion could be shown to certain industries based on their sensitivity to these proposed measures. It is certainly my hope that the policy to come will take into consideration the different needs of various sectors. Some examples include the construction industry, where a building project might last for years and even overrun, the dairy industry, which would struggle to hire herdsmen if a permission were only to be valid for nine months of the year, and the hospitality industry for the reasons I have already mentioned. But it is accepted by most, if not all, that a common policy for migration and population is necessary for the sustainable future of our island. The Migration and Population Review Panel has taken many submissions from certain of concerned parties and engaged with each of the relevant sectors. Many we have spoken to said that they recognise some form of migration policy would be required, but that further consultation and flexibility would be required before they could support one. It therefore seems prudent to vote in favour of this proposition but I think I speak for all of us on the panel when I say that we look forward to readdressing these issues that I have raised today when the regulations are put to the assembly. Jersey's chief statistician said only yesterday that he didn't expect the results of the census to be published until early next year. And I sincerely hope that the policy to emerge will take those findings into account. Thank you, sir. Very much, Deputy. Does any other member uh, wish to speak on uh, the proposition? If no other member wishes to speak, Deputy Morell. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's spoken so far in this debate. Um, there are a number of people whose thoughts have chimed very closely with mine um, and uh, I won't be trying to repeat what they've said, but um, certainly Deputy Ward, um, a lot of, of what Deputy Ward said is uh, along my lines of thinking, and I share many of his concerns as well. Same with um, Deputy Pallet, um, no, sorry, Senator Pallet, I do apologise. Um, uh, Senator Mezek as well, um, and, but also um, Deputy of St Martin, who quite rightly um, raised concerns about the uh, impact on the economy, given there's so many unknowns and, you know, life is always uncertain, but life was more certain back in 2019 than it is today in 2021. Um, we do not yet know the full extent of um, this pandemic on the island's economy and perhaps in many ways, more importantly, on the global economy and how that will eventually filter back into the island's economy as well. Um, before I go any further, I would like to uh, kind of place on record the request to split the um, vote the vote into separate parts for, for this. And so I hope the Assistant Chief Minister will um, give the Assembly the benefit of being able to vote on this proposition in separate parts. And I'll explain why now, sir. Um, Part A, I think, is something that most people 
although um, as Senator Moore has said, she, she doesn't agree, but most people are able to agree with, and that is that more action, that, that action should be taken to provide more responsive controls on the number of migrants who require the right to settle permanently in Jersey, to remove the automatic graduation from one permission to another. I think a lot of people in the Assembly are likely to be able to um, agree with that, and so vote um, for that principle, sir. The second part, part B, to request the Chief Minister to bring forward amendments to the States of Jersey Law 2005 to require the Council Ministers to develop a common policy and population. Equally, I think, as we just heard from Deputy Ayer, um, I think many States members agree with that, sir. The, the problems that I personally have with this proposition all lie in part C, which is why I would like this to be split when it comes to the vote, sir. And th there are two principal reasons for this. The first is the one I've spoken about already, which is the enormous uncertainty um, with regard to Jersey, the health of Jersey's economy. Um, the actual population we have, as we stand here today, we do not know how many people have left the island um, due to the pandemic. We don't know how many people have stayed. We have no idea actually of the reality of Jersey's population situation as we stand today, sir. And that is very important because we don't know how, how the population is able to work in the economy as we stand here today, sir. We don't know where there are jobs missing, where there aren't jobs, uh, sorry, where there are people missing for jobs, where there aren't people missing for jobs, where there are too many people for certain types of jobs. We have no idea of that as we stand here today. And part C is very prescriptive. It talks about introducing nine month permissions, four year permissions, 10 year permissions and so on, sir. And the reason I asked the Attorney General, and I was pleased with his answer, but the reason I asked the Attorney General about whether there is a legal binding on, on the uh, proposer to carry forward those parts is because I don't believe we're in a position today to know whether those are appropriate permissions. They may well not be because we do know that the work undertaken for this proposition was done pre-pandemic. Um, we know that these permissions are the same, essentially, that were brought forward in the interim uh, migration policy um, back in 2019, I believe, though I may be slightly wrong on that, sir. And so given that this is old work and the world has changed dramatically since then, I think it would be unwise of this assembly to place any political pressure on the Chief Minister and the Assistant Chief Minister to bring forward specifically those permissions. It might be that they, um, that in the course of the coming year, that the work that is done confirms that these are the right permissions, in which case there will be no problem with the um, Chief Minister and the Assistant Chief Minister bringing these exact permissions back again as uh, proposed legislation. But it might also be that they are completely inappropriate permissions um, going forward. And so for this assembly to politically tie, if not legally tie, but politically tie the chief minister to such um, a prescription, I think is, is deeply unwise. And so, sir, I'd ask the assembly to not vote for part C, because that will then give the chief minister the freedom to work during this year to come up with the very best permission statuses for the economy going forward, given the better understanding of the economy. This also chimes uh, with representations that states members have had from the Chamber of Commerce um, and also the Jersey Hospitality Association, who have quite clearly said that they are very concerned post Brexit, post pandemic, that these extra controls would be inappropriate for a recovering economy, sir. And so I, I do ask members to join me in not voting for Part C, purely to give appropriate freedoms to the Chief Minister to adapt um, the government's interest on the right position. And the fact that we will have voted through Part A still means that we expect permissions to be brought forward and um, we are just allowing them a blank page in terms of uh, deciding which is the best way forward. Another part of 
part C that I feel is inappropriate, and I said before, is part seven, which provides for an independent statutory expert panel to research and advise on population matters. So the reason I believe this is inappropriate is because, as we see with the FPP, this is effectively an outsourcing of decision making and an outsourcing of democracy in the island. Ministers never, at least openly, question or oppose the FPP's um, advice. What the FPP says goes is from my observation of what has happened in this assembly since I joined it, sir. The trouble is, is for all the wisdom on the FPP, there's no accountability there, sir. And so what we see is that ministers are perhaps, and I, I use this um, in a broader sense, lacking courage to challenge the FPP or to go against the FPP's recommendations. Um, and yet the electorate, islanders, are unable to challenge ministers because the ministers always point to the FPP and say, well, but they, they said this was the best way forward, so we're doing that. I believe strongly that it should be the right of the government and whoever is the chief minister and whoever is the treasury minister and whoever is any minister at any time to make these decisions themselves. And I believe the electorate want ministers to make these decisions themselves. Now, if a future chief minister should decide that they want to create their own advisory panel, um, that is absolutely fine and they can do that. But not to make it law is incredibly important because the moment that panel becomes law, that panel becomes the effective decision maker. Yes, people will say, other ministers will say, oh, but they're just advising. That may be so. But as we see with the FPP, they effectively become the decision makers. And I, sir, have had it up to here, sir, with this outsourcing of democracy in Jersey. It is inappropriate. Time and time again, we are seeing that political leadership of this island is being eroded by independent boards being placed at the decision making end of the um, of the political process. Conversely, at the other end, the regulatory end, we, we see a lack. I, I will mention the lack of an independent environmental regulator. That still that role still sits with the minister. Regulation should be independent. Advice and decision making should be political and should not be outsourced. To. And I feel incredibly strongly about this. And so I do not want any chief minister to be bound by a statutory, a statutorily um, established board that will that will mean that the island is forever population policy basically being decided by that board, not by the political um, states members that are elected by islanders. It will be this board essentially appointed by the Jersey or essentially with the appoint their appointments overseen by the Appointments Commission and the obfuscation and lack of clarity that that brings. Sir. So, sir, I ask um, members by voting for parts A and parts B, you are in no way stopping the Chief Minister and the Assistant Chief Minister from bringing forward the nine, four and the nine month, four year and 10 year permissions that are described in here. You are in no way stopping the Chief Minister and the Assistant Chief Minister from setting up their own board. But what you are doing is giving them the freedom to rethink, given the incredibly certain times we are in, given the fluidity of the world we live in at the moment, you are offering them space to rethink, or the assembly would be offering them space to rethink and to rework the policies to make sure that we do in fact get the very best migration controls um, that serve both the economy and enable us to control population growth more effectively. So, sir, I, I'll reiterate that. Please feel free, vote for parts A and parts B, but please do not, please vote against part C. Do not vote for part C because that ties the hands and there is absolutely no need to do that. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Gida. Uh, sir, uh, this will be a little bit awkward because I was um, intending to uh, go strongly against the last, the last speaker, but actually I find myself completely in agreement with him. Um, basically, 
One thing about the um, measures that this proposition tries to introduce um, is that they are, in principle, the only one that we can introduce. Uh, there are tools, and uh, they have to fit um, with the um, British immigration laws, because we are part of the common travel area, so we have to fit that, and they have to fit with our own housing laws. So basically, the um, the terms that are described there uh, are what is possible. Uh, well, how we apply them, of course, is uh, up to us. It's up to the policy that we still have to design. Uh, but those are the only tools that we really have available. So th there's not much leeway in that. However, I agree, again, with the previous speaker entirely, that um, if we skipped uh, paragraph C, then uh, we still leave the government with uh, uh, an open book on what uh, measures they want to use. Uh, also, I completely agree with him uh, on the, uh, the fact that the panel should be advisory. Uh, that we, we really don't need statutory panels. That's delegating our own work to other people. And uh, there's very, very little point on that. And especially uh, in a matter such as immigration, which is only of relevance to people already in the island. Uh, it's very, very difficult to look at another country and, uh, and say, well, you know, that's how you should manage yourself uh, on, on immigration matters. Um, I, I, I really don't see, I can imagine um, very, very good economists telling us what will happen to a sector of the industry if we apply brakes that are a little bit too strong. Um, but uh, to, to, to be a statutory panel and tell us how we can accept people in, in or out of the island, I, I really don't see that. Um, so yes, if the, uh, first of all, I would like confirmation from the um, uh, assistant minister on whether he's happy that getting rid of paragraph C still gives them the freedom of creating those tools which are desperately, desperately needed. And as I said, the only ones that we can bring, the only ones that can exist. Um, and uh, after that, I'd be very, very happy to vote for A and B and just keep C and give them the freedom that they need. Thank you, sir. Very much, Mr. Deputy Thank you, sir. And I'll speak only briefly um, to express some of my concerns about what, what's going on here. And the first thing is, is this is so such an open ended uh, proposition um, described as in principle, but uh, the principles are hard to define. And, and, and the question in my mind is with such a lack of any detail whatsoever about rights or about obligations or about transfers it seems to me that i must ask the question so what's this hiding what's the real plan and then that takes me on to the next stage which is to say and and is it critical that this has a certain timing when are we going to know if we've got a policy that actually works to keep our population down? We won't know until very close to the next election. Ah, ah now call me cynical. But I think uh, had this Council of Ministers not come up with something to say look we're doing something about population it's been your concern for the past 20 years and we've not dealt with it but now we are dealing with it but in the time scale that this appears uh, the, the answers it won't be clear that this plan is working either and that makes me think extremely cynically that all this is is a voice saver. it's a face saver and that it, it enables the council of ministers to go up on the next elections and say, look, we're doing something about population and migration, vote for us. Whereas had they come with nothing, had they not been to have something to place in front of the electorate, they would have been slaughtered. And that's the thinking, I think, which, uh, which explains why this is such an empty proposition and in principle proposition. 
because it, it serves its purpose of getting this council of ministers through the next election and that's i think i suspect that's uh, uh, that may be all it does um although i i'm i'm tempted to, to say that uh, with with the lowest minimum wage of all our rivals and colleagues uh, and neighbours um it seems to me that and I'm following from Brexit, it seems to me that rather than having too many people, we too may be in the position of uh, of others, of other small communities, small island communities, where the, the problem is going to be, be attracting enough people to our shores, um, because I think we, we, we're in for a tough time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, does any other member wish to speak on the proposition? No other member wishes to speak on the proposition? Then I close the debate. And um, I note the Deputy um, Ward, you asked whether you could um, raise the question of the questions that you asked to be addressed in the summing up. I'm afraid not. That would amount to a second speech. But, um, doubtless, uh, the rapporteur um, will address those that he wishes to address uh, in his summing up. I call upon the uh, Deputy of St Peter to respond. Well, thank you, sir. And thank you, everybody, for uh, taking part, um, and those especially who listen in these really important debates. Um, we cover a lot here. I think, firstly, I'd just like to reassure members that whilst we've discussed the word in principle, this is about migration controls. Um, it doesn't mention any numbers up or down. It doesn't relate specifically to any specific industry, sector, government body, healthcare at all. That is not the point of it. It is purely, as I said earlier, it is about the taps. We have a leaky tap. Our plumbing doesn't work and we need to fix that plumbing, fix those taps so we have the ability to turn them on or off, hot and cold, depending on the needs of the islands. The purpose in part is to ensure that when we come to the assembly with a population policy, which is we know um, as a result of P120, the amendment, and is part of this proposition by the end of this particular year, uh, we are in a position to be able to make that policy meaningful. Because as we know, and it's been mentioned by many, that we have the uncontrolled migration of running at 1,000 a year or 1,200 a year. And as Senator Mezek uh, reminded us in 2014, and I think it was part of the Island Plan of 2011, was based on an inward net migration of 325, that has not worked. So this is merely the first step of those controls in place. What we do after that, I, I hopefully I, I laid out um, quite clearly as um, a, 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 a plan to go forward to the end of the year. And um, part of that will be to bring back these in principle regulate in principle will come back as regulations uh, towards the end of the year. And that is obviously the time when more detail will be um, included. Many of which was said today, hopefully uh, will be added to and enhanced in many cases in the in committee debate on, in three weeks time, which I'm hoping to lodge soon. Um, when I have absolutely clarified my thoughts exactly about what is going to be. But in principle, as I said in my summing up before, this is in the hard box. 
many of us, many of you, I knew I've been here two and a half, whatever, three years. This is a long running saga. It's longer than Coronation Street about the desire to have a population policy. We ought to know it's in the hard box because we have to, as I said before, manage those tensions of our finance, our society and our environment. And it needs a collaboration of all of us as an assembly, both the executive and the non-executive, to have a will towards delivering that. But that's for, next, that's for three weeks time and ongoing. Today, we're talking about the tax. Now, I was delighted to listen to Senator Pallet because, and I think Senator Pallet said this, and others mentioned the word collaboration. So there is a will, hopefully within the assembly, to move to move this process forward. Data, um, I love data, and don't ever ask me to come up with data, because I will go back to the quote that I've used in uh, many occasions from Jim Barksdale, the former chief of Netscape, uh, which was an early runner to Google and didn't quite win. If we have data, let's look at data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. And I don't want to use my opinions or anybody else's opinions. I want to use the data. And that is what we are going to help. To, we need our expert panel to help assess the data, to enable us to make informed decisions based on that data. And we need the, the and the lack of data, as Senator Pallet quickly pointed out, is holding us back. And we need to get there as quickly as possible. But that unfortunately has a finite time. We can't deliver that until the end of the year. And we're not going to have the census, ba uh, census data to the end of the year. But that's the will of the assembly in, in, in asking us to bring the population policy by the end of the year. And we'll do whatever we can to make sure that is as relevant as we possibly can. And don't forget, it will be fluid. If the population policy is frozen, then we are missing. It has to be dynamic as we um, as we we work our way through the quagmire ahead of us of sorting this out now um i i, I will try and go through the the individuals i mean rob Wood, school teacher gave me four very good questions i'm not sure i wrote them down properly I'm sorry, I I'm sorry, deputy. apologize I'm sorry. Not I'm so, i must interrupt you purely, um, deputy uh, I'm I'm write it down and get them out on time i think he asked to um Deputy of St. Peter. Deputy of St. Peter. He can't see anybody do anything. Could you put in the chat, please? Would he please stop speaking? OK, turn his microphone back on. Deputy, I had to mute your microphone because I was trying to intervene uh, for a significant period. You clearly were not looking and you clearly were not listening. Uh, you had your, you must have had your speakers. Apologize. apologize, sir. We have a technical thing here. Far, please, please, I'm, I apologize, sir. Very well. Um, but it is important that any speaking member can be interrupted <laughs> by the presiding officer. Otherwise, there's not much point to any presiding officer. Um, the position was that you began your speech when you were talking about individual members being supposed to provide uh, reference to a deputy by his full name. And um, clearly that's not the first time that this has happened. And I was merely wishing to interject. Um, and the point is not perhaps as important as the fact that I couldn't be heard. To interject, say you should uh, maintain the formalities. And please, it's not Rob Ward school teacher, it's deputy board. Um, and uh, if you would please maintain the formalities as you continue to speak. Thank you very much. My my apologies, sir. I believe I have adjusted the technology whereby I can now hear you and also speak at the same time, which which shouldn't be too difficult in 2021. But a bit of bit of finger trouble between the finger and the keyboard, so I apologise. Um, Thank you very much. To um, to Deputy Ward, I, I think that is, is where I got to, is to, uh, he, he posed four questions. And I think I was at a point of saying he wanted reassurance that the decisions were made by politicians. I think I covered that point, not elected members. Um, 
and how the new permissions will be used. Um, sorry, where am I? He asked then about the next steps, which um, I believe I articulated um, when in committee debate, um, returning to the assembly in the summer with the uh, migration controls fleshed out. Um, I believe the public consultation will go up throughout the summer. One of the most important things is to go to um, all people that submitted and more to the migration policy board because it's important we have what I will describe as a gap analysis between what was submitted before and any changes that have happened uh, as a result of Brexit, certainly the unforeseen consequences of breakfast and obviously particular reference to COVID which has dominated this assembly for the last year. Um, I, I think another one was the, um, yeah, that was Brexit and COVID impacts taken into account, gathering data and uh, the policy uh, looked rushed. I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, all I can do is give absolute credit to um, um, the, the, the policy board members and the officers who have brought this to the assembly for us today for debate. Um, yes, um, we've got an echo, it's just gone. I, I, I think a, a lot of the what Senator Pallet was talking about, we need more details. Um, I'm very delighted that it, he it recognised um, that the majority of people who submitted to uh, scrutiny fully understand that we do require um, 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 what do we require sorry um, do we require such controls and they are necessary uh, I'm delighted that that was recognized and, and also his support um, which I'm mentioning for um, for uh, data um, Again, that was again supported by Deputy Luce. Um, uh, Christina Moore um, mentioned uh, Senator Moore first, and Senator um, Moore. Senator Moore, sorry. Um, the um, Children's Commissioner has confirmed that the um, this uh, proposition of control housing walk law fit within the, um, the rights of the child and however we will be bringing um, an impact assessment to this proposition to ensure that that is the case and that is clearly a, a priority um, forgive me i mean Sen senator mesic I, I can only say that this has taken too long and this has taken too long because it's in the hard box and um, all I can say is ask for his support and his contribution as we go forward to, to, to ensure that we can deliver on something. Um, I, I personally think there's only two people that, that would want to take on a population policy in this island. You've either got to be incredibly bright or incredibly stupid and I don't know which one I am at the moment but um, it really is a task that needs to be taken on and it, and it needs, needs some absolute courage and it also needs great support from the whole of the assembly. Um, quite right to point out healthcare, children, family issues and, and I thank you for praise um, in the, the, the hearing that we had. Um, I believe that um, we need to sell this island um, for a migrant workforce. Uh, as I mentioned, gone are the days um, when, when people were queuing up to come here because there was a, a financial disconnect between other parts of the world and ours where, where we, we could pay uh, money that uh, those, those families or people could take home to their families. Um, I remember it clearly my first job in nine, the summer of 1977 working on a farm with some of the early Madeirans that were in this island and uh, that, that was a great learning experience for me uh, socially uh, as well as it, it, it made it absolutely clear in my mind I didn't want to be a farmer because it was far too much like hard work but it was really clearly instilled in my mind the work that people were doing to, to, to send, send money home to their families. It's different now we need to sell the island 
and we need to ensure as i said that if they come here and if they're working in a, in a in a in a in a hotel and they cover themselves in chipped fat or if they have an injury working on the fields they must have health care um, at the outset uh, we must check to look after those things and their social security contributions can't be seen as say thank you we'll squirrel those away and you can go away i i, t I think that's immoral and i will not support that but thank you for reminding me of that um oh, deputy morell uh, we have our discussions and, and his views are are quite well known um, and he is concerned about the panel being a statutory panel. Um, my advice is that it may be a statutory panel, but it isn't a decision making panel. It's an advisory panel. And again, it's up to us as politicians to whether we listen to that advice or roll over and accept it. We listen to it and we interpret that and make our decisions accordingly. And, um, and again, um, Deputy Guida is questioning that. But, but I see that uh, this is so much in the hard box that uh, we do need to, I fear I'm gonna say something I hate saying, we do have to reach out and seek the huge guidance and wealth of experience there to help us bring forward and continue to manage the population of this island on an evidence-based way. Um, um, Deputy Southern, cynical about timing. If I've missed anybody, I, I, I apologise. There's an enormous amount to take on. However, sir, I mean, all, all I would like to do is to ask members to support this proposition. Um, it is the first in the latest stages of steps in order to get in the population policy that this island wants and needs. And um, I, uh, yeah, we can't we can't kick it down any longer. We've got to put our best foot forward and, and start the process of, of delivering on this. And uh, with that, sir, may I call for the appeal? Well, sir, two things arise. Um, Deputy Ward has asked, would you give way for a point of clarification? Uh, and that's the first point. I, I, are you prepared to? Um, um, I would like to take it, sir, if I may. Uh, part uh, I'm, A, I'm, A, I'm sorry. C that to deputy is six please, uh, in one deputy part, some, and then deputy seven some, and uh, eight separately. Um, deputy St. Peter, uh, are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Clearly not. Could someone in the room with the Deputy of St. Peter, if anyone's there, um, give the Deputy the opportunity of uh, being able to hear? And, uh, so we've done that. Um, Deputy of St. Peter, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I was again trying to um, uh, interrupt, uh, but again, um, the technology appears to have failed. The question that I was asking originally was that are you prepared to give way for a point of clarification for the deputy forward? That's the first point. And then the second point would be how you wish to take the proposition. Yeah. On a uh, a point of clarification. Point of clarification, yes, please, you, sir. Yes, you're, you're, you're prepared to give a point of clarification. To yes, of course, of course. Deputy Ward. Thank you, sir, uh, and thank you for your patience. Um, so the point of clarification is whether the uh, proposer can, the Deputy of St Peter, can respond to the question I put directly regards how Part C would apply for people currently on the island, whether he can answer that question in his response. So uh, I think it was very clearly put in my speech. Uh, thank you, sir. Yes, I hope you got that. Uh, yes, I apologise to Deputy Ward and um, you will. The answer is in the report as he is scratching around this paper. And I think it's page 34 of the report, section 7.1 under transitional provisions. Um, I'm not inclined to read it all out, but very it is very much transition. It doesn't affect anybody who is already here. Um, who has um, um, has the um, 
uh, of those that are already here and um, have settled settled status. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That that is clear. Thank you, sir. I think it's important to clarify that for everybody involved. Thank you very much, Deputy. Sir. Thank you very much. Um, now, how do you wish to take the proposition, Deputy Speaker? Um, can I please take the population of A, B, and C down to? Uh, I think it's six, sir. Yes, please. A, B, A, and B, and C down to six, and then take seven and eight separately, if we may. And you wish to take C seven and eight separately? Well, I think that that can um, that can exist as a matter of logic. Uh, so. Um, on that basis, you're entitled to have it taken in that way. So the first vote will be. Sir, if, um, if I. Deputy um, Morell, yes. Yes, apologies, sir, for intervening. Um, I, I did ask, and I appreciate it's in Deputy of St. Peter's um, gift, but I did ask that A, B, and C be taken separately, sir. So, um, so I, I just reiterate that request whilst appreciating it's within his gift. Uh, you'll be asked whether you're prepared to take it separately in that way. It's entirely a matter of you, Deputy. I'm, I'm inclined, sir, um, to uh, appreciate and respect sir, Deputy Morell's question, but I, I would like to stand by A, B and C to six, please. So the vote uh, then is on whether or not to adopt paragraphs A, B, C, uh, subparagraphs one through to subparagraph six of the proposition, the other two subparagraphs to be taken separately. So the first vote is on A, B and C, uh, C being subparagraphs one to subparagraph six. Very well. Um, the, it's a, the way the vote is taken is entirely a matter within the gift of the deputy of St. Peter. It is his proposition. And accordingly, uh, I asked Griffith to place a link in the vote team. In the, in the uh, chat. The link is in the chat and I ask the deputy to open the voting. Members have had the opportunity of casting their votes. I ask the deputy to close the voting. The uh, parts A, B and C, one to six of the proposition have been adopted. 31 votes pour, 14 votes contre in the link uh, and a further three votes pour in the chat. Uh, the, 14, the 14, yes. Those members who voted contre were Deputy Pamplin, Deputy Alves, Deputy Morrell, Deputy Tadier, Constable St. Saviour, Senator Moore, Senator Valois, Constable St. Hallier, Senator Mezek, Deputy Lahegra, Deputy Ward, Deputy Jubilee, Constable of St. Martin and the Deputy of St. John. Very well, uh, we now come on to uh, paragraph C7. Uh, that's to provide for an independent statutory expert. Sorry, not, that's not the amended version. Uh, to provide for the independent statutory expert panel appointed subject to the oversight of the Jersey Appointments Commission. Uh, that the, we have already um, rated. So I asked the Greffy to put a link in the uh, in the chat on sub paragraph. And I now open the voting and ask members to vote.
Members have had the opportunity of casting their votes. I ask the referee to close the voting. Paragraph C7 has been adopted, uh, 25 votes poor, 19 votes contra in the uh, link, and uh, one vote poor, one vote contra in the... We now come on to... Yes, we now come on to part eight. And uh, sorry, so I asked, for, could I have the 19 read out, please? I'm sorry, Deputy Tadia. Yes, the 19 can be read out. Those votes in contra were Deputy Pamplin, Deputy Morrell, Constable of St. Saviour, Senator Mezek, Senator Valois, Deputy Lahegra, Deputy IA, Constable of Greville, Deputy Young, Constable of St. Mary, Constable of St. Prelard, Deputy of St. John, Deputy Wickenden. The Constable of Trinity, Deputy Southern, Deputy Ward, Constable of St Martin, Deputy Tadier, and Deputy Alves. Very well, there are now two further subparagraphs to deal with, um, eight and nine, and um, the next vote is on paragraph C8. And I ask the Beth here to place a link into the chat. And I open the voting and ask members to vote. Yes. Did I understand? It? Members have had the opportunity of casting their votes. Then I ask the referee to close the voting. C8 has been, uh, I'm sorry, I'm waiting. C8 has been adopted, uh, 31 votes poor, 12 votes contra, no abstentions in the link and a further two votes poor noted in the chat. The last paragraph to be dealt with is uh, C9, which is the one that provides for a committee of the state's members to hold responsibility for determining applications under the CHW law that fall outside formal guidelines. So that is the final part of the vote on this. And I ask the greffier to place a link uh, when he's able to do so in the chat. And the link is in the chat. I open the voting and ask members to vote. Members have had the opportunity of casting their votes. I ask the Griffith to close the voting. Did 
the uh, final part of proposition C9 has been adopted. 34 votes pour, no votes contre, no abstentions in the link, and a further two votes noted pour in the chat. Therefore, that concludes uh, this aspect of um, public business. Um, you indicated desire to speak. There's no basis on which you can uh, do so, I'm afraid, Deputy St. Peter. Um, Merely wishing to thank everybody and apologise for my technical um, uselessness. So no, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's all I wish to say. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Deputy, the technology is a challenge to us all. Is the adjournment proposed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very well, the Assembly stands adjourned until 2.15.